بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله we are here um, at the final class the seventh class we've added an additional class so that we can make sure we complete or do our best to complete the text الحمد لله um, of purification of the heart. Uh, we're going to start on the uh, disease of heedlessness for today. It's on page 101. So we're just going to jump right into it, inshallah. Bismillah. <clears throat> heedlessness is being careless concerning what God has commanded one to do and has prohibited. Scholars of this science consider heedlessness to be the source of all wrongdoing. Its cure is to be found in four deeds, all of which possess rectifying qualities. Seek forgiveness from God, visit the righteous, invoke benedictions upon the Prophet wasallam, and recite God's book. So heedlessness or ghafla is a terrible lack of attention to what is infinitely more important in one's life than material goods. Heedlessness is a key concept often discussed in Islamic spiritual treatises and is referred to in many passages of the Qur'an. Imam al-Junaid, a prominent 9th century scholar, argues that heedlessness is the one pathogen that breeds all the rest of the diseases of the heart. The Arabic word for a simpleton is mughaffal, a person who is easily fooled. In our context, it is a person who is easily diverted from what is essential and consequential toward what is ephemeral and ultimately pointless. <clears throat> so, alhamdulillah, um, you know, this is, I'm sure we all recognize a very serious problem in today's world. Uh, people just don't have their priorities straight. Uh, they are caught up in, you know, the world and all of its many distractions. Um, and that's what heedlessness is, is when you just don't have the right order of what should uh, be your priority. And you ultimately, um, you know, stop doing the things that you should be doing in terms of taking care of your responsibilities, first and foremost to God, your family, all of the people in your life that should have your uh, focus because you start living for your own whims and desires, right? That's the, the distraction part of it is that you just get caught up in whatever you want to do um, and then you basically end up uh, failing to fulfill the obligations that you should do. So if you go on page 102, <clears throat> the heedlessness that Imam Maulud speaks of here is that of its most menacing form, being heedless of divine purpose, accountability, the resurrection, ultimate standing, and judgment in the hereafter. The full manifestation of these events is veiled to us by the thin wall of death, the timing of which is the secret that hovers above the heads of all men and women. Even though the reality of these things is hidden in the realm of the unseen, what is expected of us is to receive and accept the message of the Prophet said, I'm brought. So, <clears throat> You know, just to be completely clueless or, or my, you know, um, again, oblivious to the fact that we're created with a purpose. We're here uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, created us to worship Him. That is the only reason why we're here. Um, but when you don't think of that and you're just caught up again in your worldly affairs, then not only do you fail in your duties to Him, but you also completely start to deny everything after this life too, right? It's, it's, you don't even think about death and the fact that it's looming over your head um, at any moment, right? Nobody knows when, when they will die. So you become so unaware of reality, right? These are all real things that are gonna happen. Nobody can escape death uh, because the heedlessness has, you know, you again distracted uh, by, by whatever whims and desires you have. So if you can scroll down further on that same page, um, in the Qur'an you will find ghafla mentioned several times in different forms, but almost invariably referring to unawareness. The Qur'an uses other words to refer to unawareness. Those who laugh at the Qur'an are samidun. This is in Qur'an 50, chapter 53, verse 61. 
They are so immersed in amusement, they are oblivious of reality. <clears throat> On the day of reckoning, the heedless will be driven to their chastisement and be told along the way, you were once heedless of this. Now we have removed your, your veil from you, so your sight this day is sharp. God speaks of the disbelievers impervious to the message of the prophets as having a cover, rishawa, over their eyes. <clears throat> so again, this concept of, or this idea of being uh, completely, you know, blinded by amusement and entertainment, right? This is another description of those who are heedless, as they are always looking to be distracted, you know, in that way, just to be amused, entertained, because, you know, not having that and actually being still and forces you to think about things seriously, right? Um, if you actually have moments of silence and moments of contemplation where you're not being amused, you do start thinking about responsibilities, things you have to do, and maybe your purpose and why you were created. And, and that's exactly the type of thoughts that we should welcome. But when we're looking to be entertained, amused, we're basically, you know, looking to be distracted from those thoughts, right? From, from thoughts that are serious and important. <clears throat> the last paragraph there on page 102, the ultimate trauma of heedlessness then is not seeing reality as it truly is. It is choosing a way of living that allows divine signs to be left unnoticed. The Prophet Sallallahu sup supplicated that God the exalted show him things in their reality distinguished and clear show me the truth as truth and give me the ability to follow it and show me falsehood as falsehood and give me the ability to avoid it imam Maulud says ghafla is also heedlessness of what god has commanded and what he has prohibited or seeing the difference between the two as irrelevant so you know again you just become irresponsible in every way uh, in terms of the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you start to blur the lines between what's haram and halal and you just don't really take those things seriously this is the disease of heedlessness um, <clears throat> and then you know that uh, that dua that the Prophet made is so important because part of you know this disease is that your unaware but how do you become unaware it's that you don't have you know clarity you don't see things as they truly are so asking Allah to protect us from being fooled tricked right because the dunya has that quality that it can you know uh, tempt you into things uh, giving you this false notion of happiness of you know instant gratification of all the things that people you know fall into but at the end of the day those things actually don't you know have lasting effects and they cause more more harm so to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from you know those to, uh, being tricked you know and being deluded by the dunya and that's why that dua is so important to let me see truth as truth and falsehood as falsehood right so that you can follow the truth and avoid the falsehood inshallah um, so now the treatments there's four different practices that uh, basically will treat or help help someone with this disease of the heart if they commit to it. The first is repentance and seeking forgiveness, right? Um, as a matter of regular worship, one should ask for forgiveness, astaghfar, at least 70 or 100 times a day, according to the prophetic practice, which was closely followed by our righteous forebearers. This practice is connected to accounting for one's deeds. At the day's end, the merchant looks at his ledger to calculate his earnings to see what the scales say, so to speak. The moral scales are no less important, and each of us is a merchant with regard to what we lost or gained with respect to, God, with respect to God's pleasure. When there is loss, which is a frequent occurrence, seeking God's forgiveness restores balance. So being in the habit of doing istighfar is very important. Um, and this, again, can be done, you know, anywhere. You could be doing it driving, washing your dishes, folding laundry, you know, um, anything that you're, you know, doing uh, or, or actually on your prayer mat. But finding the time to do that, and many people say it's best to do that at night, right? You could be doing even lying in bed right before you go off to sleep, that these are your final thoughts, you know, like, Ya Allah, forgive me for 
all of my transgressions today, what I did knowingly, unknowingly, big, small, out in the open or hidden, because we 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 sin in many different ways, right? Um, and sometimes we don't recognize uh, that there's even sins that we can do internally, right? Like last session we talked about ghibat al qalb, right? That's a th that those are thoughts that nobody is aware of. So sins aren't necessarily outward actions, right? They can be inward as well. So you, when you actually take the time to take account of yourself, you might be aware of things suddenly like, oh, I forgot about that, right? <laughs> I need to make a stuffbill for that too. It, it, and not just look at the outward. Think about, follow the thoughts that you had that day too. Did you think of someone ne in a negative way, right? Did you have those, you know, bad thoughts? And, and that's how um, you hold yourself to account. Now imagine if you did this every day, it's kind of like taking out the garbage, right? Think of it that way. Because if you, if you don't take out the garbage, it, stinks up right and starts to pile up but if you have a habit every single day that i have to take out the garbage you're avoiding all of the problems that come with letting garbage accumulate so the same with doing a stuff is that you're you're detoxifying you're getting out all those uh you know the bad deeds that you've uh, done that day as a means of purging as a means of cleansing as a means of ridding yourself of uh, the harm of those things right and you're just again al uh, aligning yourself with with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, doing that re you know reflection that I remembering your purpose. You know I'm here for a reason. It's to worship you, Ya Allah. And I recognize that I failed. To, you know it, it maybe today or I didn't do as well today. Forgive me. So you're reaffirming your faith, right? Every time you do that process. Uh, otherwise, you know you fall into heedlessness, which is you're not you're just being careless and you're not thinking. The second practice is, and again, this, we're on page 103, that that's the last paragraph right there. The second practice is visiting Ziyara, righteous people who enjoy rank with God the Exalted. Classically, the ranking of humanity proceeds as follows. As evinced in the verse of the Quran, prophets, a nabiyin, truthful ones, a siddiqin, martyrs, a shuhada, and the righteous, as salihin The word salih conveys the notion of soundness of heart and excellent character. More specifically, it refers to one who gives God his due right by fulfilling his commandments and avoiding what he prohibited. This is haq al-ibadah, God's right to be worshipped, which includes rights of worship as well as excellent behavior towards other people. Hence, a righteous person does not cheat or lie. He or she is the kind of person whom one should seek out as company. Scholars have always encouraged visiting righteous people as part of the protocol of the spiritual ascendancy. These people include the living as well as the dead. If one goes to Medina, it is recommended to visit the graves of the great Muslims and convey salutations of peace to them. The Prophet ﷺ visited the grave sites of his fallen companions. During the early part of his message, he forbade the visiting of graves, but later on the Prophet ﷺ encouraged it. In pre-Islamic times, visiting graves was a form of idolatry. When the young community was purged of that, the Prophet ﷺ abrogated the previous command. So. Again, visiting righteous people can be living or or deceased, but it's important again to uh, to recognize that the qualities of what we're talking about the the righteous person isn't just outwardly necessarily religious, because sometimes we might assume things about a person because of the way they look on the outside their character is what you want to look at so if someone is outwardly maybe looks like they're practicing but then they don't have good character they don't have good adab with people they don't speak well and kind to people uh, they you know they have other negative qualities just because outwardly they look a certain way or they might have a title you know you want to really be clear on what we're talking about here <clears throat> yes Yes. Right. No, that's a very good point. Again, we're talking about good character, people that you learn, you know, who don't cheat, who don't lie, who 
who have a belief in God, you know, and there are non-Muslims who have very good characters and you can learn a lot from, especially, you know, elderly family members or just family members who take their faith seriously, who are people who have, uh, you know, moral compass and, and they, you know, values that they live by that are shared between faiths, you know. So absolutely, if you have people that are like that, who you trust and believe, uh, yes, that keeping their company is great and, and you can learn so much from them. But thank you for that question because it's a good clarification there. Um, then, you know, he talks about the religious charlatans in that second to last paragraph on page 104. It is excellent to visit the righteous among us who are alive, those who are truly pious and knowledgeable. One cannot judge another person by title. In many Muslim countries now, men, and men are presented with the title of sheikh as inherited from the father. As a result, there are people with that title who are ignorant. These are, there, there are charlatans in this world, and none is more dangerous than a religious charlatan. So, you know, we have to, again, be careful of those people who use the religion to advance themselves, but they don't have, you know, they're ignorant or they don't have good character. Those are not the people we're, that this is about. Um, on page 105, <clears throat> oh, uh, yeah, he goes on a little bit more to talk about when you're visiting, uh, you know, these people, how you should behave. So in that middle paragraph, when visiting a righteous person, the discourse should be substantive and not of idle talk. One should seek to benefit in gaining knowledge and in the supplication of the righteous person. In fact, one should ask for being continually remembered in their prayers, for their prayers might be more acceptable to God than one's own. So, you know, making sure that the conversation is a benefit, right? And you don't also overstay. Uh, that was mentioned in a previous uh, chapter where we talked about not overstaying, you know, when it, when it comes to people. Uh, who are, you know, in this, who are righteous or scholarly or who have important work to do. And then the third cure is to invoke benedictions on the Prophet ﷺ. This is, in fact, a command from God the Exalted Himself. O oh, you who believe, invoke benedictions upon the Prophet ﷺ and salutations of peace. This is in chapter 33, verse 56. So, you know, increasing one's salawat on the Prophet ﷺ, and there's many, many benefits to doing that. Um, if you go to page 106, Sidi Ahmed Zaruq once said, if you do not have a murabbi, a spiritual mentor, they say prayers of blessings upon the Prophet ﷺ, uh, then say, excuse me, prayers of blessings upon the Prophet ﷺ, which acts as a murabbi. Many scholars have attested to the fact that sending prayers of blessings upon the Prophet ﷺ purifies the soul. Some recommend that one repeat it at least 500 times a day. Some people make it their practice to repeat it 5,000 times a day. Imam Malik constantly sent prayers of blessings on the Prophet Sallallahu and Muhaddithun, scholars of prophetic traditions, are well known for this practice as well. So, you know, again, you can find that range, what works for you, but not to limit yourself. You don't have to be doing it always sitting down in one place. It's, if you can, that's, you know, recommended. There's a comportment that we should have whenever we do the kir of Allah or, or salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu But also if you're, again, you know, doing something else, like I, you know, I, I think uh, because we live in, in the Bay Area and there's so much traffic and commute time, a lot of times, you know, the times that we're by ourselves in our cars can be great opportunities to do this type of work, you know, listening to the Quran, doing salawat, doing any dhikr of Allah. So that's always the first thing that comes to mind. But really any chores, any things that you're doing that you can, you know, that you're obviously in a clean place um, uh, to do, it, it's fine to do these things as you're doing something else. You know, to keep you uh, engaged, inshallah, and keep your heart connected. The fourth cure, and so, uh, we're still on page 106 here, for heedlessness is the recitation of the Qur'an. Reciting it with tadabbur, reflection, awakens the heart. However, plain recitation is beneficial as well. Learned Muslims have recommended that a person recite one thirtieth of the Qur'an every day. If this is difficult, then reciting Surah Yasin after the dawn prayer, Surah Al-Waqiyah after the sunset prayer, and Surah Al-Mulk after the evening prayer greatly benefit the soul. So, you know, again, you can, even if you don't know the Arabic meanings, there's still incredible benefits 
to reading the Quran. So, you know, don't put limitations on yourself, you know, that, oh, I don't know it well, um, I don't have proper tajweed, uh, because you can read for meaning, you know, and, and practice, you know, that's how we become better. Listening to reciters, uh, obviously getting a teacher would be ideal, but sometimes people, because of maybe something they were told or cultural ideas, they think, you know, you have to recite it perfectly in order to to recite it, like to even do it. How are you going to get there, you know, if you don't practice with everything? Like with everything you have to practice. So if your intention is to get better, then you actually get more reward with all of those mistakes that you're making. So, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees your efforts and he's rewarding you more than the one who recites beautifully and effortlessly and has no mistakes, right? So you want to be incentivized to recite the Qur'an, you know, that way, like as often as I can and, and you know, try to reflect on its meanings, but not to impose, you know, sanctions on yourself that, oh, I have to get to a certain level in order to do it. That thought we should, we should reject. <clears throat> so these are the four cures that Imam Maulud offers for heedlessness. Alhamdulillah. So it's, uh, may Allah protect us from that, inshallah. Okay, so we've got a lot to cover. We're going to move on to Rancor, uh, page 108. And we'll read the verses. Rancor, O oh you who seek its elucidation, is when the heart is bound to treachery betrayal or some trickery the not binding it to the heart is resentful malice show kindness toward the object of your rancor and you will cause your enemies to despair keep also in mind the forgiveness as mentioned in the sound tradition promised twice a week on mondays and thursdays so ghil is a malady of the heart that is closely related to rancor which is extreme anger and malice it comes from the same Arabic root from which the word aglal originates, which is used in the Quran to mean yokes around the neck. And this is chapter 36, verse 8. As if to say that rancor dwells in a heart bound to rancor and, treachery, and treachery. Rancor is a pungent emotion that is rooted in being extremely angry at a person to the point that one wishes harm to come to him or her. But the ultimate victim of rancor is its carrier. For this reason, believers pray, O oh Lord, forgive us and our brethren who came before us in faith and do not place onto our hearts rancor for those who believe. For those who believe. Our Lord, you are kind and compassionate. One of the great blessings of paradise is that God will completely remove any semblance of rancor from one's heart. So, you know, again, to hate someone so much that you actually intentionally will evil to, to them or that harm come to them it's it's be you know it's more than just dislike right we can dislike someone be annoyed by someone um but hatred where you really wish that something terrible happens to someone this is rancor and Imam Maudud says that if a person feels rancor toward a particular person he should show that person goodwill by nature people are naturally inclined to love those who do good so the treatment is to really fight yourself I mean one of the, there's so many examples of people who overcome feelings of anger or even justified hatred. For example, a person that comes to mind is, um, his name is Dr. Abdul Munim Jitmud. He's the brother whose son uh, died. He was a pizza delivery man, I think it was a couple of years ago. Uh, he was a Muslim, Salahuddin was his name. He was a young man. He was killed. And this brother, mashallah, his father, I mean, imagine, you know, someone killed your son in an act of robbery, you know, you know, pizza delivery guy. It's not that much money, but it seems so justified to be angry, right, and to hate the murder of your son. But subhanAllah, in court, he actually forgave his son's murder and, you know, and hugged him, embraced him. He had, like, the judge in tears, you know, everybody. But he said it was because of his faith. He did it actually for the young man because he said, in our faith, if, you know, if the one who's been wronged doesn't forgive, then God will not forgive. So that type of magnanimity and, you know, to overcome that type of hatred, there are people who can do that. So then how petty is it for someone to, you know, have rancor for someone for, for something so, you know, trivial that usually is the case, right? 
uh, I didn't like the way they, you know, they, they didn't invite me to this or, you know, they were, they did this to me. They, but it's not something like this. I mean, this is murder, you know, of your child. So if there are people who can overcome, you know, justified anger like that and then be so generous and magnanimous, then certainly we have a lot of work to do, right? So think about people like that. But that's the type of goodwill that you want to have for people that you really try to force your heart to make the offer them, to wish them well, their families well. And inshallah, as you continue to do that, Allah will remove that hatred from your heart. And just to remember that, you know, whatever injustices that you may feel have been done to you to warrant that will be addressed, you know, nothing is forgotten. So sometimes we don't, you know, we don't remember that Allah subhanahu wa is, you know, going to take us to account for everything. And that's what the Day of Judgment is for. So if not in this dunya, just think of the next world, you know, but have that faith and yaqeen that everything will be addressed. So you don't need to be a rancorous person, a vindictive person, a vengeful person. You need to let go of those feelings because they do more harm to you. And they say more about your, you know, what you're lacking spiritually by even having those feelings. Um, so let go and really force yourself to work on that. Like, I need to just stop thinking about this person, move on with my life, and know and trust that my Lord will handle them, you know, at some point. Whether he chooses to forgive them or not, that's entirely his decision, right? Okay, <clears throat> so we can go on to boasting and arrogance on page 110. <clears throat> this is a big one. <laughs> So we'll read from the poem. Boasting is counted among these peculiarities. It is defined as your praising yourself for good qualities. You should deem it vertiginous mountain as insignificant, by which I mean, of course, arrogance. Do this if you desire it to collapse to the ground. Do that by knowing your Lord and knowing yourself, for whoever knows these two is humbled and feels insignificant. The station of arrogance negates the station of gratitude, such as humility, by its nature engenders gratitude. Avoid and beware of humiliation and lowliness. In fact, display pride with the affluent and arrogant one. So, <clears throat> Imam uh, Maulud speaks next about fakhr, which is the loathsome practice of boasting. Exceptionally odious is the practice of bragging about what one has not done or exerted any effort toward, like bragging about one's ancestry and borrowing from some past nobility. Boasting is a problematic behavior that universally evokes objection and is considered a spiritual disease. No one likes a boaster one who walks with a swank and swagger, and one who cannot be in the company of other people without speaking about himself or drawing attention to what he has done. God himself reveals his dislike of bragging. God does not love the arrogant and boasting ones. And again, this should really, for our generation, you know, and our children's generation, uh, we, we have to kind of, you know, really... Um, make this message very clear because it's everywhere now. The culture that is around us is one of constant boasting and showing off and displays. And if we don't, and we're not, you know, mindful of do we do it or do we participate in it, um, you know, for ourselves and what can we expect for our children and what they're going to go through, right? If it's so rampant now, it's everywhere now, what are, what's going to happen in the next five, ten years? because it's it's everywhere and, and especially with youth it's it's a big um issue now with a lot of youth especially on social media that their real aim is to just you know brag about whatever they can to try to get the attention and notoriety that they all seek because it's about money right it's about fame it's about money and how do you do that you gotta have some talent some skill something to show off um and so they it's so normalized and that's the issue it's so normal everywhere so i feel like we really need to revisit this with our children often to to never fall into this um we're on page 111 <clears throat> imam Modid mentions the force behind the culture of boasting namely arrogance right um with arrogance, what is alluded to is glorification and aggrandizement of the self. So, 
it's the core I reason why someone boasts is because they think themselves something, right? And arrogance is when you think of yourself better than other people. So you boast to basically seal that, right? It's like, here, I'm going to tell you why I'm better than you. I come from this family, or I have this much wealth, or I went to this school, I completed this program. You know, it's... And, and some people, you know, they do it subtly that it's not necessarily so outward. But if it's something where you even feel the need to bring attention to any accomplishments or things that you've done in an indirect way, there's still an element of boasting there, right? It could be something, you know, again, passively uh, mentioned. But if it's if the intention is to gain, you know, renown, right? That was a previous disease that we covered that people know something about you or think something about you or you know or that you just leave them feeling worse about themselves then clearly this is the root problem you have arrogance and you're you you like to make that impact you know when you're with people you like that impact of just showing that you have you know something better than them or that you are better than them and then he goes on to describe that the most villainous beings in history were fill, filled with arrogance and false pride. Satan, Pharaoh, the opponents of the Prophet Sallallahu and many nefarious, nefarious tyrants since. So it's like, that's who you are behaving like. You know, if that's not a deterrent, I don't know what is. Like, you know, this is these are the things that people like, you know, again, Pharaoh and all the enemies of, of Islam and, you know, against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Shaitan. These are their qualities, to be boastful, to have false pride. So it should, you know, be, uh, that should be a deterrent as well, that we don't engage in that behavior because we don't want to be associated with people like that. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned, right, that anybody who has even an atom's weight of arrogance in their heart will not enter paradise. It's another deterrent, like, Arrogance, boasting, these are qualities that will, you know, turn you away from, from Allah and from paradise. I will divert my signs from those who show arrogance without right. This is, you know, Allah subhanahu wa is again warning us that he will turn away from us. Um, so many more ayahs and hadith that, again, speak of, of how detested this quality is. <clears throat> And then there are different types. So this is also really important because arrogance can manifest in so many different ways. So it's important to be able to see it for what it is. The first type is when a person deems himself superior to others. Imam al-Ghazali said, people of knowledge are in great danger of arrogance than anyone else. This is because the knowledge they have attained may lead them to feelings of superiority. Um, so, you know, the people who, again... Um, turn other people away because they deem themselves, you know, better, you know. And I've seen this many times. People have complained to me about feeling that way, coming into the masjid space or, you know, attending certain events. They feel that there are people who kind of, you know, just treat them differently because maybe they're not dressed a certain way or they don't know certain things or they're not at a certain level. Um, and that you know, what happens to those people? They don't want to come back, right? Uh, they don't, you know, these are people who, who turn, you know, people away. So it's very dangerous. But that's a delusional state to be in, to think that, you know, um, that I am better because, you know, I've been wearing hijab longer or I have, you know, I've went and studied abroad and I know this and I know that. So you, you should just listen to me. And, you know, if you start treating people, you know, like that you, that way, then as I said, it's a delusional state because astaghfirullah, you're actually proving that you're far worse than them because you lack the main quality of a believer, one of the main qualities, which is humility, right? So you're, it's, you're actually getting, you know, it's, it's a complete opposite message. So the second type of arrogance is in displaying contempt and scorn towards others. Once a man saw an old woman calling to the Prophet ﷺ in a boisterous manner, yet the Prophet ﷺ stopped to speak with her, showing no sign of annoyance. When the man saw the Prophet's calm reaction, he said, Muhammad ﷺ is a man unlike the king of other lands. It is a marvel how some people act arrogantly because of their perceived piety, while the Prophet ﷺ, the best of creation, remained humble. Again, the same thing. Humility is what sets 
the believer and the best uh, of you know of people from from others is that if you lack that basic quality no matter how good you think you are um, you're you're delusional right the third type of arrogance relates to lineage in some cultures if one is aware of his high birth he is obliged to behave nobly the Arabs manifested this if a man was born into a clan known for generosity it was mandatory for him to be generous one of the blights of many societies is racism. People feel and act superior simply because of their race. The Quran nullifies false claims of superiority and states that the only rank that matters related, related to one's relationship relates to one's relationship with God. Indeed, the most honorable of you in, in the sight of God are the most God-fearing of you. Surely God is all-knowing, all-aware. So, you know, if you think that your uh, lineage, your race, your background, your, you know, um, high economic status, whatever it is that you were born into, uh, give you superiority over others. This is a form of clear arrogance. And unfortunately, it is a, a problem in many parts of the Muslim world, right? We do have a caste system in, in parts of the Muslim world, um, uh, but race definitely plays a part of it. The color of one's skin can play a part of it in, in parts of the Muslim world where you are considered better than others just by virtue of your skin color. So this is obviously, you know, an effect of colonialism, but it's definitely still prevalent in many parts of the Muslim world. So these are all would fall under that, you know, just thinking that you're superior for that, for those reasons alone. No, none of that matters. It's all about your, uh, again, <clears throat> your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the only thing that sets people apart in terms of superiority over others. <clears throat> And then he kind of, uh, he goes into the treatments, but um, let's go through the rest of the, the types of arrogance. So if you skip a page, we'll come back to the treatments. On page 114, he goes into the fourth type of arrogance. So the fourth type of arrogance is that which is owning, owing to beauty, right? The cure is to realize that beauty can be the most illusory of things. Social conditioning impacts our sense of beauty more than many would admit. Um, this is also a big problem in today's world. Vanity, you know, beauty is exploited. Beauty standards are, you know, very, very narrow. And if you f happen to fall into those standards, you're considered the elite of the elite and treated, you know, differently um, by popular society, by everybody. People just really, you know, um, ingratiate themselves towards people who they have who they think have power right and so there is a certain power that beautiful people have they have privilege they can get things done they can you know have mobility in whatever field they're in uh, i mean there's you know all these jokes and stuff but it's true they can even get out of trouble you know like not getting you know with with the law for example you know not having to be as responsible as other people so there is a certain sense of power that we've given uh, whether we're aware of it or not to people who have um a certain standard of or who meet the standard of beauty that is socially accepted right now because obviously it changes and it changes based on where you are but here in the west we have certain standards of beauty but if you do happen to have those uh then this is what you're um vulnerable to you're vulnerable to falling into um vanity first and foremost arrogance right and then you know, becoming abusive with that, with that power that you have, where you just start looking at people by those, you know, um, in that way where you look down at them because they're not as, you know, beautiful as you are. And, and you're very much aware of your power. And you see this happen all the time. A lot of celebrities, a lot of people who are, again, praised, um, for their beauty, the way that they speak about other people or behave towards other people, um, is is very clear that they have arrogance right they don't and i mean you can see it if you just follow some of these influencers and these fashion um you know people in fashion they definitely carry themselves as if they're better right and they wear certain brand names and they look down at people who don't dress a certain way it's just a clear issue that that you can see <clears throat> The fifth type of arrogance is that which stems from having wealth. The affluent are notorious for showing contempt for those of lesser means. This is not to say that all wealthy people exhibit this disease. There are generous men and women who recognize the source and responsibility of wealth. However, they tend to be the exception. 
So again, if you have wealth and you only, you know, socialize with people in your status and you don't really, you know, you're not open to, to going, uh, you know, or to having relationships with people who, um, who are not of the same status or just, you know, you're just the way that you, you, uh, you carry yourself, the way that you walk around, the way that you, um, you know, the places you go to, a lot of it has to do with, you know, how you think of yourself. If you refuse to eat at a certain restaurant, for example, because it's not to your standard, right? Or you don't stay in certain hotels or cities, or you just don't visit, you know, certain places because you think it's beneath you or below you. Um, it's likely because, you know, you come from a high privileged life and that's what you're used to. So you might not, you know, outwardly or say those things, but it might be something in your mind that you, you need to deal with, um, in terms of, do you look down on people or do you think you are better than other people? Right. <clears throat> the sixth type of arrogance is based on uh, physical strength. A very strong, a strong man once approached the Prophet Sallallahu and challenged him to wrestle. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi agreed, and the Prophet Sallallahu threw him down to the ground twice. The man was astounded and declared, I've never been thrown to the ground. His arrogance had been rooted in his personal strength, which he thought none could match. Again, when it comes to vanity and looks, this is also another area where you see a lot of, you know, people focusing on, you know, going to the gym, bulking up, um, you know, and in, I think in more maybe... And, you know, among men, this is an issue of physical, you know, strength and sh displaying their strength, walking around a certain way. Um, but it is a form of arrogance if you do think that men who are not as athletic uh, or, you know, don't, can't do as many sit-ups and push-ups as you can um, are, are lesser than you, right? And there are some men who believe that, that they look down on other men when it comes to their athletic abilities because they perceive themselves as stronger and therefore better. So it's a form of arrogance. And again, it's it's something that is so pervasive in our society that people don't even, wouldn't even maybe recognize it as an issue. Like, what's the big deal? He worked hard for it. You know, he goes to the gym, he's committed. But it's more the attitude that one has because you, you know, any blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, you have to not attribute it to yourself. So when you start, you know, attributing it to yourself, you have, you create, you increase in arrogance. And then you also look at other people as though they aren't as good as you, because if they were, they would match you somehow. Right. So you're forgetting that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who distributes, right. And he, if he's given you an advantage or something, it's from him. And if he's withheld that from other people, he, that's also from him, but not to, you know, make it a matter of you versus them, because that's when your ego gets in the way and you become arrogant and then you start abusing and, you know, mistreating people or just looking down at them. Even again, if this is, these are thoughts you have internally, you don't necessarily have to speak to people a certain way or treat them a certain way. You could just think these things. So that's the other part of arrogance that we have to be mindful of is it's the thoughts that you have in your own head. So if you, again, have a vanity issue where you're beautiful or you, you're you strong and you see someone who's not attractive and weak and maybe out of shape, do you look down on them? You know, Do you look at them with disgust and repulsion? A lot of people who, who have these, you know, they do. That's just a fact. <clears throat> the seventh type of arrogance is due to possessing an abundance of something. An example of this is a teacher having many students and thus regarding himself as being better than the other teachers who have fewer students. The same is true with those who boast of having many friends, especially those in so-called high places. This is actually pretty relevant when it comes to our, again, world today with social media, right? There are people who definitely um, look to themselves, uh, you know, and see how many followers they have, how much how many, how much social media influence they have as a means of being better, you know, as a means of more be, I'm more popular. I have more friends or I have, again, more friends in high places. I know more celebrities or I know, you know, um, people with power. Uh, therefore 
I'm better. And again, like I said, you know, these aren't things that someone has to necessarily verbalize. It's just their own internal thoughts. But if you have these thoughts, it's a sign of kibbut. It's a sign of arrogance. The eighth type of arrogance is linked to having knowledge. This type of arrogance is particularly insidious, since knowledge is a great honorable matter. However, a knowledgeable person may become deluded into believing himself to be superior over others due to the veneration shown to him. So again, if you're someone who Allah has given um, knowledge to, and this doesn't have to be necessarily religious knowledge, but in any capacity, if you just have a brilliant mind, and there are, mashallah, many brilliant people amongst us in our community, you know, who are uh, good in their studies and who've advanced because of their intellects. But if your intellect leads you to, again, think of yourself as better than other people um, and you look down on them as being, you know, dumb or just, you know, below you and beneath your intelligence, then you'll treat them a certain way. You talk to certain people differently. You treat, you know, you don't have the same rapport with them that you would maybe someone that you deem as intellectually superior or at least at the same level. So it's a very, um, you know, again, common type of arrogance, especially in our area that we live in. There's high success people, people who've, you know, really done a lot in terms of personal accomplishments. So they can fall into this easily where they do start to look down on people of different social status or, or class or, um, because, well, you know, I'm, I've, I've, I've done so much. I've, but when that, and that's the root cause of arrogance is that it's all about I, and you attribute it, your, your, you know, gifts or blessings or skills or whatever to yourself. And that's why it's so dangerous. So these various eight qualities may sow the seeds of arrogance. God created humanity and has bestowed human beings with more blessings than he has given the rest of his creation. However, blessings are coupled with responsibility. The intellectual and volitional capacities of humankind are great responsibilities. So, you know, just remembering that everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, you know, all those blessings, they also come with a certain, you know, expectation from us that we... Uh, you know, distribute, for example, if we have wealth, we share that wealth. If we have knowledge, we share our knowledge, um, you know, and we, we do good with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. But if there, it's just a matter of, you know, um, using those things for your own benefit and then also attributing those things to you, to yourself, then clearly uh, you're arrogant and you need to work on this. Um, on page 115, Imam Maulud says that the key to avoiding or removing this disease is to know yourself, your origins, and your ultimate return. The Prophet ﷺ said, I am the best of the children of Adam, and I am not boasting. His honor was entirely based on his servitude to God, the exalted, not on wealth, lineage, power, or authority. Whoever is humbled for the sake of God, God elevates in rank. Haughtiness and gratitude cannot coexist in one vessel. God increases in goodness those who are grateful. The station of arrogance invites only humiliation. And then he goes on to say, Imam Maulud says, Humility by nature leads to gratitude, for when one is humble before God, the exalted, only then does one see the vast mercy God bestows upon his creation, even upon liars and disbelievers. <clears throat> so, you know, again, just realizing that by knowing who you are, knowing the origins, uh, where you came from, where you're returning, and that ultimately, you know, everything comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being mindful of that, this is how you can get rid of this disease of the heart and invite more humility to your heart, which leads to gratitude. <clears throat> and he goes on to, to say, uh, talk about moderation. Um, right to that we should when we're being humble we should you know have humility but not to the point where it leads to us being humiliated and know the difference right that you know um, humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is virtuous and we should have that humility before his creation but we should certainly not let ourselves be um, abased in front of others, right, and mistreated or humiliated before people. So that's the last and final section where he talks about that. 
All right, so we are on page 117. Uh, we're going to continue with displeasure with blame. Okay. We'll read from the poem. Displeasure with blame is a well-known disease of the heart. Concern with people's opinions and desiring their praise and displeasure at their criticisms are a barrier from achieving the station of excellence in worship. Overcoming that barrier is through the realization that there is no benefit or harm unless it comes from God, the possessor of all dominion, exalted and majestic as he. Furthermore, what is prohibited from this disease is what leads to the prohibited, just as Imam al-Ghazali has elaborated. The perfection of sincerity is that you do not give notice to any praise or blame that emanates from people. So this disease, um, the next disease is displeasure with blame. Blame is not something that people naturally embrace. It runs against human nature to love it. However, the problem occurs when fear of blame is coupled with the urgent desire for praise and approval by others, which is often the case. Being concerned with creation's opinion places a barrier between a person and the station of ihsan, excellence in worship. So, you know, this is something I think I personally... We see it a lot because people are are no longer willing to put themselves on the line to speak up, right, against injustices or things that they that are wrong because there's going to be repercussions on them, right? Especially maybe at work, for example, or socially or wherever. So people are too worried about being, you know you know, looked down upon or, you know, ostracized, treated differently somehow. So what that does is it, it makes them, you know, not speak up when, when they should. And, um, and it can cause, you know, serious harm because if we all become, you know, just silent observers of injustice and we're not willing to have the courage to speak up, then what's going to happen to our world, right? We have to have people who are willing to not care about how people see them or, you know, about being liked by people as long as they're speaking the truth, which is what the prophets did, right? Many of the prophets, they were not liked and they were not, you know, they were turned away. They were ostracized. They were, you know, um, punished by their own people because they spoke the truth, but they weren't consumed by being liked. They, that was not their priority that, oh, I have to have, you know, I have to be popular and I have to have people, you know, liking me or liking what I have to say. I am, you know, a person who speaks the truth and, you know, I, I'm speaking the words of God, and that's all that matters. So that's what we as believers also have to have. We have to have that same mindset that I have to speak the truth. And if that means not being uh, liked and not being popular, it's okay if I have to take a hit socially and I might not have a lot of followers or I lose friends along the way. As long as I'm speaking the truth, then I'm, you know, and, you know, and again, you know, the way you say certain things is important. You can't just, you know, etiquette, uh, there's etiquette and there's, you know, decorum and there's a way of properly speaking about issues. Um, so we have to have all of that, but not to run from uh, the truth because you don't want to be perceived as someone, you know, who's uh, politically incorrect or socially, you know, just, you know. Which I, which I think is what preoccupies way too many people. So um, if you go on to the next page, on page 118, and this is where, you know, we're talking now about the Sahaba around the Prophet ﷺ. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ exemplified complete loyalty to the ethics of Islam. Many times they were confronted with having to make decisions that would evoke displeasure among the people and tribes around Medina. But nevertheless, the, de the decisions they chose to make were in accordance to the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. The more that one worries about how one's decisions will be received by people, the thicker the veil becomes with regard to God and his guidance. So again, it comes down to your priorities. If your priority is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above everybody and everything else, then this won't be an issue for you. But if you're too worried about how people see you and how like, you know, liked you are, then it's going to make you compromise your beliefs. 
And that's the bottom line. And this is what we're seeing is a lot of people have compromised their beliefs. You know, they don't speak up anymore. There's a lot of hot top topics right now, you know, politically uh, that people just stay away from because it's like if I say something, uh oh, you know, I'm going to hear it from so and so. I'm not going to be invited to so and so's, you know, whatever party this year. They're not going to like me. Uh, you know, if you're, if that's your um, priority, then okay. But if your priority is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His pleasure, then you don't care about that. And so, and on, page, on the second cha uh, paragraph right there, when people give up enjoining what is right or even admitting that there are absolute and objective values which are not subject to the whims of mankind, then evil spreads. And this is what we're seeing. All throughout our society, we're seeing evil become normalized and become accepted and becoming become popularized because people are afraid to speak up. They're afraid to talk about, you know, like to morally object to things. You can't even mention morality anymore. You're looked down as what's wrong with you, you know, uh, religion, God, all of these things have been kind of, you know, taken off, it take, you know, erased from, from, from the conversations, right? Because you can't even reference them. If you reference these things, you're looked on as being that weird religious nut, you know, in the office or at school or whoever. But again, Where's your priority? Let them think that of you. If you're speaking the truth and you're objecting to something that's wrong, you know, for example, when they had um, a couple of years ago, the Fremont School District wanted to introduce certain topics, you know, to young children about blended families and different types of families, which included certain families that many religious people objected to objected to sharing that knowledge too early because it wasn't appropriate for the kindergarten and you know elementary school level we don't want children to be exposed to these concepts too early it's just not you know let us have those conversations in our own time with our own children when we have to why are you introducing that there were a handful of you know religious people from different backgrounds who uh, went, but I did, I had a friend who was in that, or she lives in Fremont, and she was like really frustrated because she wanted, she was like, where are all the Muslims? There's so many Muslims in Fremont, right? It's like heavily, you know, there's a big population of Muslims. Why aren't they showing up to these school meetings and protesting and saying, hey, we object to having this, you know, taught too early. There, you know, there were a handful that showed up, but her point was it wasn't enough. and. Likely it's because, again, what we're talking about here, people are too afraid of their image, their reputations, they're afraid of socially compromising themselves with their coworkers, neighbors, peers, so they don't speak up, even in when it's warranted. You know, if you really think, do young children need to learn the certain topics too early, and shouldn't those, to shouldn't those topics be had, you know, in with their family, right? It's a very private issue. And each family should be able to dictate how to frame that conversation. But if the school is introducing it um, and they're kind of forcing it upon young children, shouldn't we feel like we have the right to speak up? So what would hold someone from even wanting to attend? Um, it's because we've lost, again, this you know, focus of establish the truth, stand up for truth, um, and be more concerned about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than what the people will say. And if you do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you tawfiq. But if you don't and you continue to cower and you continue to be afraid and you continue to put what other people think of you before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you will be, you will see that in manifest as evil spreads and you're, you'll also be held you know, accountable for your part in that. And that's what we're seeing. Too many silent observers and not a lot of people who are advocating anymore, even within our own community. Yes? No, it's an excellent point, and you're absolutely right, because that's the agenda, you know, blend us all together, it's all about inclusivity and, and diversity, and we're all one, but at the end of the day, if you're, you know, not every message on their, you know, 
agenda aligns with your faith, you have to be at least willing to call those things out instead of just capitulating out of fear. Like, oh, I don't want to be the the odd one out or I don't want to look ungrateful like for their support. No, you're just being an honest person that says, you know, like you said, thank you, you know, for your consideration. However, this doesn't mean that I am 100% endorsing your way right, or your lifestyle choices, you know, I still reserve the right to maintain my faith and my ethics and my values, and I shouldn't be expected to, you know, um, give all of that up for the sake of inclusivity and for the sake of, you know, political advancement, which is part of, you know, the agenda, which is, yeah, to blur all of that for people and emotionally sort of confuse you so that you feel like you're, it's an almost act of betrayal if you speak up. No. Be a person of truth and conviction, but still, as you said, you know, be a uh, choice with your words, be responsible in how you articulate yourself. You don't have to be rude. You don't have to, you know, do anything, um, you know, extreme, but at least be principled to speak for the truth. You know, and that's what I think we're seeing, as I said, we're, um, it's just not, we're not seeing it as much anymore. There was a time where I think people were much more proud and vocal of their faith and they could speak up about it. And not just Muslims. I'm, I'm talking everybody, really. People of faith have cowered now. You don't see them coming out and speaking about their faith. You know, like I said, to mention God is considered weird in society now because so many people are faithless. They don't really believe anymore or they just, you know, they, it's so private that you just don't talk about it publicly. But why? Why is that okay is my question. Why is it okay to take God out of the conversation, but then we can talk about all these other topics? To me, that's where you have to say, that's, you know, that's their religion. You know what I mean? So their religion, it's forced upon us, and we have to not only welcome it with open arms, but we have to endorse it. But when it comes to our faith, we have to hide it. That's wrong, right? That's wrong, and we shouldn't buy into that. And then here, like in the same paragraph, towards the end of earthly time, the world will be virtually without witnesses to truth, and truth itself will be scarce. No one will defend it. I mean, all the bilah, man, God protect us from that. But, you know, I look to what's going on now, and I'm already seeing it, but I think about the future. Like, what? what's going to happen in 10, 15, 20 years for our children? Is anybody going to defend Islam at all? Or are we just going to quietly, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Humanity has the right to have among us witnesses to the truth. Those who are willing def to defend the truth, no matter how unpopular it may be. And so on the last paragraph, according to Imam al-Mulud, overcoming the fear of blame is achieved through realizing that there is no benefit or harm except by God's permission and plan. So stop giving people power over you to dictate what you do and what you don't do because harm and benefit only come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you're worried that, oh, by saying this, something harm is going to come to you from the people, then you're removing this reality. That no, harm doesn't come from the people. They're, if, if, uh, they're just a means. But the source, if that is the case, would be Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Same with the benefit, right? So get, like, be more clear that only he uh, dictates these things. This should sound familiar as it is the recommended cure for many of the diseases discussed so far. Two of God's most excellent names are the giver of benefit, al-nafir, and the bringer of harm, al -dar. These attributes are specific to God alone. No one else possesses them in the least. It is only God who can benefit and only he who can permit harm. If a person is worried about how others receive him, then he is not aligned with reality. And, you know, this beautiful hadith is also um, very healing. According to a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said to Ibn Abbas, he said, Be mindful of God and God will protect you. Be mindful of God and you will find him in front of you. 
If you ask, ask of God. If you seek help, seek help from God. Know that if the whole nation were to gather together to benefit you with anything, it would benefit you only with something that God had already prescribed for you. And if the whole nation were to gather together to harm you, it would harm you only with something that God had already prescribed for you. The pens have been lifted and the ink has dried. So just a really good reminder that everything, our source, our you know, first um, default to, for needs, for protection, for seeking anything should always be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because ultimately he's the source of all good. And um, and if any, you know, tests are, or if we're tested in any way, he's also the source. But to have that awareness constantly, um, so that way the people are removed from the equation. And when you remove people from the equation, it makes you more real, it makes you more sincere, it makes you more authentic. And you, you know, you're more aligned with reality. But if you always are worried about, you know, again, how you're perceived by people, what will the people say, with regards to anything, you're bound by that. You see, it's like a, um, an anchor or a, a chain around your ankle that just will always drag you down. So free yourself from that, and you'll find that you'll make decisions more, much more, um, you know just uh, truthfully or sincerely because it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and then it goes on, this does not mean that one should be reckless with his or her safety, nor does it mean that one should not take precautions. So, you know, be wise. There's, you know, when you're speaking the truth, you have to do it. It's a delicate matter. So you have to, you know, be good at, you know, making sure that you relay your message properly you don't compromise your safety or the safety of your family don't be careless and reckless but be a person of, who, who's principled and not afraid because that's really the issue with this that you're not afraid of what people will say or how they'll think of you you realize everything comes from allah but if you are worried about uh the displeasure of of people or with uh, or being blamed then it's a disease of the heart you shouldn't and you should want to rid yourself of that and then the last paragraph there is just a warning about what happens if you don't, you know, remove this disease. Imam Odud says that the inordinate fear of blame can lead a person to engage in prohibited matters or to neglect obligations. If one worries about how people receive him when he practices his faith, this can prevent him from performing obligations. Perfect example, you know, there's, I've talked to several people who t come to me and say, I have a problem with prayers, I can't complete all of them because I work in an environment where, you know, people are sometimes, you know, I so I asked them, Did you, have you asked, you know, your supervisor for a room? Oh, I'm just a little shy, you know, to ask them. And so they end up praying all their prayers qada at home. Why? Just have that strength. You have, we have religious rights, first of all, which is a great blessing, right? You can't be discriminated against for your faith. But a lot of people are so afraid of being known as that Muslim in the company or identified as, you know, whatever, that they won't even ask. This is cowardice, right? Put your, you know, if, if, if that person, if you lose your job, that's not, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who allowed that to happen. But if you're thinking that by asking, I'm going to lose my job, you see where the disconnect is? You're attributing it to the wrong source. So have the courage and the bravery to say, I need to pray five times a day. This is a priority for me. So I'm going to go ask my supervisor or my manager and tell them I'll take t some time off of my lunch, my break. I'm not asking for spe special privileges. I just need a space that I can pray safely. And to see what happens. And half the time, you know, I've done it. I've had to do it. They're so happy to accommodate you. They really are. It's all in our own heads that we think they're going to, you know, look down on us. But, you know, you might run into someone who's not very nice. But, alhamdulillah, that's why you should know your rights. And you should, you know, fight for your own rights and say, I have the right to, to you know, you can't stop me from doing this. And use your, you know, time wisely. But there's ways around it. My issue or the issue that is when people have um, that fear, you know, to even ask. This is very serious because now you're not even performing your prayers on time, all because of the fear of not being, you know, treated a certain way or liked or losing your job. The fear of blame interferes with faith. Deeds that are done for the sake of God cannot share other intentions, namely pleasing people or seeking their favor. Doing something for the sake of God is the manifestation of strong faith. 
whether one receives praise or not from anyone should be entirely inconsequential. So alhamdulillah. All right, we're doing pretty good on time, huh? Um, all right, let's go to antipathy toward death. Let me just quickly pull up my notes. I forgot I have some, some notes here. Um, I just want to make sure I'm not forgetting anything here. Okay, so there's actually a term for people who have like a, a fear or a dread around uh, the topic of death. It's called thanatophobia. Okay, so, you know, this is, and actually, I'm sorry, I, I jumped ahead. Let's read the verses first before I get into that discussion. So antipathy towards death is when one flees from it and becomes annoyed when it is even mentioned, as if he is completely ignorant of God's statement that each soul, soul shall taste death. This is reckoned to be among the diseases of the heart. So be content with what God the exalted has decreed. But if one detests death, not for its own sake, nor for the loss of pleasures that it entails, but rather out of fear of being cut off from preparing for the day of judgment by obeying God more, then it is not blameworthy. Also, if one completely entrusts his affair to his master, whatever he wills, either causing him to drop dead or giving him respite, it's content, it contents him. Both of these attitudes towards death are condemnable, are commendable, excuse me, and praiseworthy. Either way, disliking the reality of death in no way distances you from its proximity. The one who constantly remembers death is ennobled with contentment with his heart's activities directed towards obedience and with prompt repentance when wrongs occur. The one who is heedless of death is afflicted with the opposite of all three. So again, this, uh, you know, disgust or fear, loathing of death, it's uh, called thanatophobia. Okay, so it's really just any time death is mentioned, it just repels you and you want to not talk about it. And I've definitely had this happen several times. You know, we're, again, we're living in a society that glorifies youth um, and uh, condemns anything that has to do with aging, natural aging or death. It's hidden away from our society a lot. Any, you know, messages around uh, you know, one's death is considered morbid, dark, like why would you even talk about death? You can't freely talk about it in a society without, you know, kind of look, looked at as weird. So naturally, you know, people have, you know, developed a, a, just a repulsion to it. But for the believer, it's the opposite, right? We don't have, we shouldn't have that same attitude towards death because we don't look at death as an end. Right? For people who don't have faith or people whose faith doesn't really talk about death as much as ours does, it's natural to think it would just, it's an end and it's its like, that's I don't want to think about that because that's too sad or too, you know, it's just painful to even think about. So let's not go there. But for the believer, we look at death as a transition. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a closer, uh, it's a step closer to the akhirah, which is not, which is where we all want to be. So we don't look at it as something, you know, negative or bad. It's just a reality. Every single person will die. So we kind of have a more pragmatic view of it, right? Um, but let's read the discussion here. Antipathy towards death is considered a disease of the heart. It refers to a strong aversion to death to the point that its mere mention causes consternation. Such a person, Imam Maudud says, is in denial of the reality, right? Every soul shall taste death. Um, if you skim a little further down, nowadays, death is usually considered a morbid topic that is uncouth to discuss. And when it is discussed, it is often turned into some deadline before which people are supposed to squeeze in all their life's pleasures, right? The bucket list. We all know what the bucket list is. So this is the only time where it's okay to mention it, you know, that, oh, before I, you know, go, my bucket list is this, this, and this. And it's all about just enjoying life and and, you know, getting as much as you can out of your every moment here on earth. 
The Muslim's view should be completely different. To speak about death is to speak about life and the urgency to live a faithful and wholesome life before death overtakes us. So our view of speaking about death is not to necessarily focus on death itself, but to be in such a constant state of remembrance of death that it compels us to be more mindful of God and to fulfill our obligations, to take life seriously, to treat the people in our lives well, with love, um, and to take ourselves into account right? This is why we remember death. So if people, if you know people who are just like shut down, they likely don't do those things. And that's why the mention of death is troubling for them because they're not, you know, thinking on that deep level about their life and, you know, their own mortality and what that means in the, in the bigger scheme of things. They're focused more on the now or they're focused so much on their love of the dunya, hubb dunya right? Which is all about pleasure and, you know, just looking for every opportunity to, uh, you know, gain more material wealth or experiences or travel or eat or just all fulfilling, you know, your, your carnal desires. That's hubb dunya is all, it's very, you know, related to that. So when you think of um, death, it's the end of that, isn't it? And that's why if I have a love of life because I love to, you know, consume, why would I even want to think about the end of that, right? Um, but if I am aware of my purpose, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created me for a reason, and that death is looming over my head literally every minute of every day, and I don't know when that moment will come, then that makes me take my life more seriously which doesn't mean you can't have fun and you can't be a person who, you know, who's light and and has uh, invites levity into their lives. No, be a person who but everything has a time and a place. Um and that certainly certainly shouldn't be your purpose, right? Is to look for entertainment and amusement and laughter and, you know, fun 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 fun. I mean, that's not the reason why you were created, but you can have moments of that. Right? So just finding that balance. So here, for the believer, there is comfort in death. For the believer is taken from an abode of difficulty and trial to one of peace and unfathomable freedom. In Islam, the mourning period is short and should not be prolonged. The irony of extending the mourning period is that doing so is rooted in excessive love of dunya. The more one covets this world, the greater the sense of loss when a loved one dies. So that's actually pretty powerful because it's a great way of coping with loss. We're going to experience loss in this world. We will. Some of us will have to bury our parents. Some of us, may God forbid, may have to bury our children or other loved ones. Um, may Allah protect us from that. But whatever the case may be, if you understand that, you know, this world is temporal and we're all on the same trajectory, we're all going to die, and I don't, I, I need to let go of, you know, my my attachment uh, to the morning you know, process or that, you know, grief um, and, and work on that, you know, in terms of just being surrendering to the will of God, because I know that it's not over, right? There's more to our purpose than just being buried six feet under and that's it. We have a next chapter and that is what I'm looking forward to. And that is eternal. And inshallah, um, I have hope that I will be gathered with my loved ones you know, in eternal bliss, you know, that's faith, that's iman, that's having conviction in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that you look always with those, you know, that, that positive um, eye. But if you're doubtful of whether or not you're going to see your loved one again, and you're not so sure, and your iman is, you know, sort of being tested, then it prolongs the grief for you, right? So it's just something to consider. May Allah protect us again. You know, death is certainly um, a tribulation or the loss of a loved one is, is many times um, 
a tribulation. And here, everyone experiences the loss of a loved one. When the Prophet ﷺ lost his son Ibrahim, he, he wept, but also praised God, the source of life and death. People who have strong faith in God and in the afterline, afterlife tend to handle death well and also handle calamities and tribulations well. So, again, it's a measure of your faith, how you can cope with those things, because you know that there's more, you can, you know, gradually move on. Um, but that's not to say you shouldn't allow yourself to grieve. Allow yourself, but don't let it overtake you and paralyze you from living life, you know, which unfortunately happens to a lot of people. And this on page 122, the second paragraph, the one who remembers death is ennobled by certain characteristics, which include contentment and a lack of covetousness. So if you, you know, remember death instead of run from it, there's all these other benefits that you actually start taking on really good qualities and virtues, mainly being content and you lack covetousness. You're not, you know, wanting all the time. The Prophet ﷺ said, contentment is a treasure that is never exhausted. He also prayed, O oh God, provide for my family with what suffices them and grant them contentment with it. The wealthy soul is one that is content. This contentment is not the kind that originates from stupidity or not knowing any better. It is contentment that is informed by knowledge and by reflection on death and its meaning. Second, the remembrance of death gives one energy to achieve good deeds. Wealth and sons are the ornaments of the life of this world, while enduring righteous deeds are better with your Lord in reward and better in hope. So when you remember death often, again, because you start to take your life more seriously, you pursue good deeds more. You're actually looking to, how can I, you know, get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How can I, you know, um, make sure that I end in a good state and that I, you know, am raised inshallah with, uh, you know, in a good state, like all of that, you're preparing, you're investing in your future because you're so aware of these realities. So what that does is you'll become more charitable. You'll start giving, you know, um, you'll do more good deeds. You'll pray more. You'll read your Quran. You start taking your deeds more seriously because you're so aware that death is, you know, is imminent and I need to take, whatever time I have on this world seriously, in this world seriously. Third, the remembrance of death engenders seeking repentance when one slips or errors. Penance rectifies wrong action, and that is the gift of remembering death. When one lives with his realization, he or she becomes prompt in seeking God's forgiveness. If you're aware of death, just, I mean, ask anybody, you know, who you know or who you may have known who, um, you know, was given a diagnosis of a fatal illness. Why do those people become so much more aware of themselves and take themselves seriously? Because they have that awareness of their own death. It's like could happen two, three years from now, four years from now, five years from now. So it makes you someone who is less likely to, you know, hurt other people or to fall into wrong action. But if you do, you at least, astaghfirullah, may Allah forgive me, please ya Allah forgive me. So you become more habituated to seeking God's forgiveness more because again, you're so aware of death. Our problem again in this world is because it's so distracting and we do have false sense of security um, in our youth and in our health, right? That we don't think about death anymore, um, that we, we just, uh, we become heedless, which is why this whole coronavirus thing is so interesting, right? Because uh, everybody's suddenly panicking and I think people are really, you know, they're first of all securing themselves, you know, uh, clearing out all of the hand sanitizers and soaps and wipes and everything else off the shelves and stores. But I think I'm sure there's also more, a little bit more reflection happening about life and, you know, should I do this? Should I not do that? You start taking your choices a little bit more seriously. You're factoring in other people maybe more because in the absence, I mean, of, of these things when they awaken us to our reality, we fall into heedlessness and we become very self-absorbed, right? Very selfish with our choices. But suddenly something like this happens and all of a sudden people are waking up. So there is a blessing in disguise sometimes to these things, right? And that's why we have to just put our trust to Allah. Okay. All right. So Dhuhr is going to be in, okay, we still have time. 
So we'll go to, oh, you have a question? Yes. Right. You know, I think you want to give people hope, right? Especially if they're grieving. And so it's if they're a believer, inshallah, we should always have that hope for them and make that dua for them. We certainly don't know where anybody's going. Nobody has that knowledge. But if your intention is to offer that as a way of, you know, just giving someone consolation and making them feel better with their loss, it's not a bad thing to say, you know, inshallah, may Allah give them, you know, Jannat al Firdos, or, you know, you can always frame it that way as a dua instead of a firm statement. I think that's more uh, responsible, just uh, that, that that's what you wish for them, as opposed to they are. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very Western thing. Yeah. I think if Muslims are adopting that, it's a Western thing, because that's a, you know, like rest in peace. And that's, that, that's more, I think, you know, popular in this culture, but like t traditionally Muslims, I think, avoid making declarative statements because those things are only in the knowledge of God, you know, and we shouldn't do that about anybody. We should just hope for, right? But thank you. It's a good point. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah. All right. So page 123, we're now talking about obliviousness to blessings. Among the faults of the soul is obliviousness to blessings. It's root lies in inattentiveness to the statement that whatever blessings you have are from God. By simply remembering this and keeping in mind other verses of admonition, such as, he does not change, and if you show gratitude, then this chronic disease can be excised from you. So this is a lack of understanding and acknowledgement and disregard that whatever blessings you have are from God. This is a verse in the Quran, chapter 16, verse 53. The blessings that come to us night and day are beyond numeration. As the Quran reminds, these blessings come in all forms. What we can see and touch by way of material goods, food, clothing, shelter, wealth, and the like, as well as what we cannot see, such as safety, friendship, love, health, and protection from harm and calamity. The Qur'an begins with the, with the phrase translated as, In the name of God, the merciful, the mercy giving. According to some scholars, merciful, Rahman, refers to the giver of the major blessings, while mercy giving, Rahim, implies the giver of subtle blessings, which are not perceived until they are removed. For example, we blink thousands of times in a day without thought. There are people, however, who require artificial lubrication because their tear glands do not function. There are countless blessings related to the eye, let alone other aspects of our lives, such as our ability to walk in balance without needing to consciously stimulate dozens of muscles required to take one step. Our thumbs permit us to do with our hands what most creatures cannot attempt. God has made food delicious and flavorful instead of bland. He has also given us dignity in our nutrition, which is, tr which is a tremendous blessing, especially when one considers the way carnivores devour their prey. While we cannot count our blessings, we are commanded to be grateful for them. So subhanAllah, I mean... All of those things and so much more that we, unless you actually sit as an exercise of gratitude, which some people do recommend doing, right? To keep a gratitude journal because it'll force you to recognize the blessings of Allah that you're given either on a daily basis or just, you know, since birth that you might not even uh, be aware of. Um, you'll become forgetful, right? And then if that forgetfulness... Uh, is continues then it leads to this where you're just totally oblivious and you're not even you know recognizing that you know anything and everything good that we have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the source of every blessing is from God and you know that's why it's a disease of the heart because you either don't aren't aware of that at all or you falsely attribute it to yourself or other people it's like you know this is what it leads to when you become oblivious Right, that that you start to uh, think of things not as they are. Um, the fact that the Quran has been revealed to tell us 
to reflect on these blessings is in itself a great blessing. For without guidance, the human being cannot be on his own de determined. Can, for, for, excuse me, for without guidance, the human being cannot on his own determine out how to live. To deny God's blessings can lead to outright disbelief and denial of God the exalted. So again, that's the same, you know, point that the more you continue to be oblivious to the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will deny uh, God eventually. And that's what happens, you know, to so many people that they, um, they've just erased God from their lives and their minds because they don't attribute blessings to him at all. They don't look at their lives, their privileges, their health, their wealth, their material goods as coming from God. They look at it, you know, from their parents or themselves or their bosses or whoever else has somehow impacted their life. And so as you keep doing that, then yeah, God just isn't in the equation anymore and you forget him. And then eventually religion and faith become irrelevant because you don't feel like there's a need for it. And that's what we have now. We have a, we have a you know, world of godlessness where people are increasingly just, they don't recognize um, his blessings. And then it leads to denial and disbelief. So that's the, the danger of this disease is that this is what it leads to. Um, on the next page on 125, um, the third paragraph there, it says, Those who are ignorant see only short-term relief as a blessing and disregard the benefits of patience and temporary discomfort. On the other hand, knowledge opens the eyes to the long-term benefits which last forever. Um, so again, it's just talking about, you know, if you're aware of, the blessings in your life uh, and that, you know, you might not have everything that you want, but be patient, right? Because patience is, is um, awareness that this world again is temporal. It's short. I'm not putting all my expectations here. So I'm going to be patient, you know, with whatever God's given me or withheld from me. You have a more realistic view of what's happening. But if you're someone who is in denial of that, then you're looking only at short, you know, term, like immediate gratification, immediate satisfaction. And so your lens becomes very, you know, myopic. You're just looking at the dunya and, and you're stuck here. So an, an intelligent person sees the bigger picture and they realize that there's, again, um, much more beyond this, this realm. There's a lot more there. And then on the page 126, how to look at the blessings in your life. Blessings are either roots or branches. Roots include faith, Islam, health, safety, and well-being. The branches are money, clothing, shelter, and the like. According to the Quran, the children of Israel disputed with the prophet among them over the choice of Saul, Talut, as their king because he was not a man of great wealth. However, their prophet told them that God has given Saul knowledge and strength, which are blessings greater than wealth. So actually seeing again, what's more important, a root or a branch, right? Branches can fall and break easily. Roots are buried deep and they hold and they, they have so much more function. And they, you know, they, they're, they're really established, right? They're, they're rooted. So, you know, to, to not, uh, to see that, um, wealth or to not have the understanding that knowledge is above wealth, right? Is again, you know, a problem that many people have where they, their priorities are off and they're, you know, deluded by the dunya so that they don't see something so obvious that a person who has knowledge of God and is aware of their purpose is far better than someone who just has material wealth, right? But it's inverted now. We're living in a world where everything is upside down because people are praised much more for wealth and status and material goods or material wealth. That whatever home, how big their homes are, if they have a plane, if they have cars, you see the celebrity uh, influence, right? Or the, you know, um, f 
influence of, of fame and exorbitant wealth and living lavishly, that stuff is very praised in this culture. Whereas people of knowledge, like teachers, look at let's look at you know, our teachers are given nothing practically, you know, in terms of salary and compensation, and they do some of the hardest work on earth, like to actually help cultivate young minds and prepare them for their futures. Parents have hard time dealing with one, two, three children. Imagine classrooms of 30 kids or more that you're responsible for every five days out of the week, eight hours or more every day. It's a huge responsibility, but we, t we treat our teachers and educators as insignificant. You know, they're just, they're not respected and that's why you have a collapse of authority right in our society they're not respected anymore and half the time they're disciplining in their classrooms so knowledge is just undervalued and then you know wealth and celebrity is overvalued and there's this imbalance right it creates this this total imbalance so you have to know how to see the blessings that god's given you in their right you know like context that to have Deep faith, that's a root, right? I'd rather have that than just have something, you know, external like money, clothing, um, and, and the like. So the Prophet once asked a man, do you know what the completion of a blessing is? And the Prophet told him, entering paradise. The best of blessings are those connected with entering paradise. That right there. Whatever blessing you have, look at what's going to lead you to Jannah. If that's the one that you want to value more, not other things, right? Faith, patience, good character, swiftness in doing good, promptness in worship are blessings from God. And they are everlasting. Islam itself is the completion of God's blessings upon humanity. This day I have perfected for you your religion, and I have completed my blessings upon you, and I have chosen Islam for you as your religion. The ornaments of this life include houses, furnishings, clothing, and the like. The more one acquires of these blessings, the more he will be accountable for. The Prophet said that the meat, dates, and cool water that we consume are of those things we will be asked about, even the sandals on our feet. So all of these, these are privileges, right? And this is why we have to look again at our, the lifestyles we have and really realize we're not just blessed, but we're given abundance more than most people in the world. But that abundance comes with responsibility that we have to know we're going to be held accountable for, right? We'll be asked about how we used those privileges or those you know, our wealth or whatever we were given, were we truly grateful for those things or did we just kind of expect it? You know, the entitlement, which is a big problem. Sometimes we can, we get very entitled and we forget. And that's what we have to teach as parents. We have to teach our children, you know, not to take things for granted. If you cook them a meal and they don't want to eat it because it's not, you know, good enough for them, you can't go, okay, let me go make you a brand new meal. No, it's like the worst thing you do. But you see parents do this all the time. They give in to that sense of entitlement and they have to make a special meal for that one really picky eater. No, no, and no. <laughs> Children will eat if they're hungry and you indulging their nafs that way is not teaching them to be appreciative of the blessing of homemade food by mother's hands or father's hands, you know, while where, where other Children barely get to eat anything cooked. They have frozen meals all the time or no meals at all, right? So you have to give that perspective to your children to say, eat what's in front of you. Say, Bismillah, be grateful for it. This is a fuel for your body. And, you know, but I think this entitlement culture is so pervasive now. A lot of people fall into this. So, And then they wonder, you know, why their kids aren't grateful. You know, you, did you teach them that? You know, you have to teach them all, all times. Say Bismillah, say Alhamdulillah, follow up with them. Whenever they get anything, recognize Allah. Take yourself out of the equation. Because sometimes we also, you know, put ourselves in it. Like, I worked so hard to make you that. I, bu I bought you this. Well, if they're going to show you gratitude, where's Allah? 
No, deflect it back to him. Alhamdulillah, if it wasn't for Allah, we wouldn't have this. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave mommy and Baba the means to be able to give you this. Alhamdulillah, I was feeling good today and I was able to cook you this meal. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me that. You know, always direct it back to Allah so that you're not in the picture because you know what, one day you're not going to be in the picture and you want to make sure that they're equipped, right, with that strong faith to carry them through when you're not there for them. And Allah is always going to be there. To be Zahid, the last paragraph, an ascetic, does not always mean a lack of material possession. There is asceticism of the heart in which one is not attached to the material world and is indifferent to it. In other words, a person's character and level of faith will not change if he loses his wealth. That is the sign of a Zahid. However, if one falls apart and plunges into despondency when losing something valuable, it shows an inordinate attachment to worldly life. So just not having that attachment, kind of seeing if something breaks, khair, it's dunya, it's okay, I'm still fine. You get, you know, alhamdulillah, there are people like that. They'll get into a car accident and they're not, they don't care about the car. Is everybody okay? Alhamdulillah, we're all good. Right? We're all good. Then there are other people who just can't get over the fact that their car is totaled and it's gone and they, they're, that's what their main priority is, you know? It's like, yeah, okay, we're good, but still my car. But it's like, subhanAllah, think about what just happened. You just, you know, quote unquote, cheated death. Allah, you know, spared you death and he spared you a horrible car accident that maybe could have left someone with, you know, lifelong problems, alhamdulillah, everybody's intact, everybody's good, let's be grateful and not worry about the car. The car can be replaced, right? That's the kind of perspective that we need. And, and you know, just the ability to detach ourselves from whatever worldly possessions we have. Okay, so we have, alhamdulillah, we're getting close. Oh, we have one more, yay, look at this. <laughs> in the last class and we're finally on, we're on, uh, we're on schedule here. This is all. Yeah, we're on a roll. Alhamdulillah. So the last disease is derision. Okay. As for derision, tend to it with the same treatment used for arrogance and with the knowledge that one's purpose in derision is to humiliate someone. Yet by doing that, a person actually humiliates himself with God and is recompensed with misfortune. Also treat it by knowing the severe warning that has come in Sahih Muslim about showing contempt for any Muslim. So this disease derision is ridiculing people, making jest at their expense. Moses salam, told his people that God had commanded them to sacrifice a cow. They replied, are you mocking us? Moses salam, then told them, I seek refuge in God from being ignorant. Hence, mocking people is a form of ignorance, whether it is lampooning, caricaturing, or name-calling. Humor and levity are important in human life, but levity as a way of life harms the spiritual heart. Furthermore, the laughter and amusement at the expense of the dignity of others is wholly inappropriate, although it is the staple of the comedians of our day. You know, this is a big problem in our culture because a lot of times comedians or people who are famous they've become famous by ridiculing and mocking other people. And we're consuming it, right? And it's especially detrimental, I think, for boys. And I'm always, you know, when I do a lot of work with teens and youth talking about the dangers of this type of culture of, you know, um, pranks and, you know, doing things that are, uh, you know, uh, you wait for someone who's un unsuspecting to walk by and then you trip them or you, you know, you just do something terrible to and exploit someone's vulnerability for a laugh and you get it on video and then you post it on whatever platform you post it on for likes and shares. It's really despicable, I, but it's so everywhere. Like I just recently wrote a post, um, Last on Sunday, almost a week ago, I downloaded because I heard from so many teens about this app called TikTok. I don't know how many of you are on it or know about it, but it is horrible. It's probably one of the most toxic things I've ever seen in my life. But the videos on this, a lot of them have to do with this. It's ridiculing people. And sometimes, you know, unsuspecting people, like kids will 
post um, videos of their parents yelling at them, you know, for something. And they're just laughing. Ha, 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 look. You know, l listen to my mom going crazy about whatever it is. You know, you put the, left the dishes in the sink. And, you know, she has no idea that she's, her private moment in her ho home is being uploaded for millions of people to potentially watch and, you know, laugh at. Or grandparents, you know, it's just unbelievable that these kids are um, getting away with it. I just, I don't know what kind of a culture, I mean, family uh, dynamic would be okay with, with uh, that, that type of behavior. You know, that they, this is uh, accepted or acceptable, you know, to, for example, there's this terrible thing where they'll, you know, I saw a couple of videos like this. They'll hold up a water bottle to, like, their parents and the parents don't know what they're doing. They're like, what, what, do we, what do we do? Do we want me to smell it? What? And then they just squeeze it and it explodes all over their face. Why is that okay? Like, that is not okay. That's terrible. You know, and sometimes the parents are like, why? You know, and then they cut off the video. So you don't really know what happens after that. I imagine there's a lot that happens after that. But it's like, it, that's okay to do. And you see all these like hundreds and thousands or millions of likes because it's okay. It's funny. It's funny to get your parents and humiliate them that way and then put it up for everybody to watch. Or they have this ridiculous thing with Mentos and soda. You know, grandma, put this in the bottle. You know, and that's like a total chemical reaction. So it explodes in their face. I mean, it's just really horrible things. These are pranks, quote unquote, and they, it's made to be like funny, but no, if it's at the expense of someone who's innocent, who doesn't know, it's not funny. But unfortunately, you know, this is again, something that is so popular in this culture. You know, I'm sure you guys remember that, that show on MTV that got very popular and it's kind of where it started. Uh, the Jackass right? It was a very popular show. It was the entire show was pranking innocent people on the street, random people. But you see this being okay. And by the, by this, by, you know, by everybody, because we're encouraging it. If you're going to like and follow people who do that, you're saying it's okay to do that. But at what point do we stand up and go, no, that's wrong to do that. Like you can't prank people. In Islam, it's haram to actually scare people for fun. And kids need to know that. Like, it's not funny to hide in a closet or under the bed and wait for your mom and then, you know, try to scare her. But if the popular culture cartoons and film make it like, oh, it's funny, then you think it's funny. But no, we have wisdoms in our faith that don't let people ridicule other people. But also, you know, someone's heart could stop. Like, if you did that, I mean, imagine you could kill someone who had a heart condition. That is not funny. <laughs> so I think we just have to have a a conversation around this because it's such a serious problem but also you know comedians a lot of celebrities this is what they do they advance their careers by taking down other people and mocking either groups of people like races you know culture they'll do a lot of impersonations or things like that where they're mocking or they'll take down individual people right so derision is a very common disease of the heart in our world today Imam Ulud says that the cure for the psychology and practice of mockery is similar to that of arrogance, since a person who mocks another most likely sees himself as superior to his victim. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, Do not belittle anyone, for he may be a saint of God. Even if one sees a man inebriated and bellicose, so drunk, okay, drunk and angry, vomiting in the street, one should not ridicule him, for one does not know what his future holds. Imam al-Qurtubi said, when he was bowing down to idols in Mecca, Umar ibn al-Khattab was still beloved to God. Only God knows the seal of people and their destinies. A Moroccan proverb says, never mock any creature of God, for it might be beloved to he who created it. Okay, so just having... Removing this arrogance where you think you can look down on people or mock someone or presume anything about them because you don't know someone's end. You can't presume anything about anybody in the moment because in that moment they might be doing something that you don't agree with, but as an individual, who they are is only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so just to avoid falling into that habit.
<laughs> Absolutely. No, there really is. You have to believe that. As much, like, no, it's a good point because he's so uh, made mocked and made fun of and ridiculed. And it's we shouldn't do that. I you see Muslims all the time calling him, you know, really terrible names, mocking his um, hair, things that he had no control over, his face, his skin color. And then everybody's laughing at it. But it's not right. He's he's a human being. His leave him to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can hate or dislike policies. Stick stick to the subjects. You know what I mean? But when you start mocking a person's physical features and the way they speak and it's just it says more about you. And that's the problem. Like you it doesn't look good because these are not things that Muslims who fear Allah and who understand these things do. Because they just, you know, it's not um, proper adab. Could you imagine? It's just we you don't do that. You don't see any. Look through you know our history, and you find um, where anybody did that openly, where they would mock another person, um, like a person of you know, like high, uh, sta like a scholar or anybody of you know that we know was held in high esteem at any point in our history. Did they do that? Did they openly mock another person? based on their physical appearance. Never. You don't see it because it's not something that a believer does. Right? Did you have a question? Yes. Sure. They do it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. It's an excellent reminder because you're right. A lot of times, we, um, you know, we t children t learn from modeling us, and if we're not mindful of how we speak and how we frame things and how we say things, then we, um, you know, teach them that it's okay to do this and this is not acceptable. We should uh, again stick to issues and and policies if we have issues with you know someone like him, but not to you know, give in to deriding him and mocking him as a human, as a person, right? And he's just one example. But I think in general, it's just not the behavior of people who are mindful of God. They don't do things like that. Um, so, yeah, this is, alhamdulillah, there's a lot more here about... Um, just stories that are relevant to this. So we'll just read the last um, paragraph here. People can be transformed. The opponents of the Prophet ﷺ were particularly vicious against Muslims. Hind actually bit into the liver of the Prophet's uncle, Hamza, when he was martyred at the Battle of Uhud. However, she later became Muslim and hence became a companion of the Prophet ﷺ, a member of that special generation of humanity. In fact, she even narrated hadith that can be found in the well-known compilations. Repentance is a recourse that the Lord of the Worlds has given humanity. Reflecting on the ethic that the Qur'an communicates to us is in the aforementioned passages reveals that there is strength in dealing nobly with people. It is simply a better way to live. The treatment for derision is to realize that the essence of mockery is to humiliate people. Those who mock people in this life shall be mocked in the hereafter, for it is a divine law that God recompenses people with the like of what they have done. So that's, you know, the treatment for it is know that the essence of 
you know, deriding people is that you're trying to humiliate people. But if you want to protect yourself from this, remember that whoever humiliates people in this life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will humiliate you in the next life. May God protect us from that because we definitely do not want to be amongst that group. Alhamdulillah. So we have um, a few minutes before uh, Dhuhr and our class was scheduled to end a little later because there is a couple more sections here. The comp comprehensive treatment for the heart, beneficial actions for purifying the heart, and the root of all diseases of the heart. Did you guys, were you able to read any of that? Or Yeah? Okay, alhamdulillah. So we can, uh, you know, take some questions if anybody has any questions or comments right now. Um, break for the dhuhr and then come back and address those other sections. Yeah? Sounds good. Any questions? Any comments? Anything? Anybody wants to share? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. No, for, for all blessings are gifts, right? Everything that we have in this life, uh, whether it's material or physical, the health that we have, everything we should see it as a blessing and a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's given to us. Uh, but as was mentioned many times, with all of that comes responsibility. So it's not just for us to have it and possess it and hoard it and keep it, but to utilize it for the greater good, right? To serve his creation and to, um, you know, to draw nearer to him. So it's not enough just to recognize it as a blessing. You have to use it, right? Because there's a lot of people who have, let's say, wealth. But if you're not using your wealth for good and you're hoarding it, then this could actually, you know, you'll, you'll be held accountable for it. So you have to recognize it, but then also implore, use it for, for good as well, in whatever way you can. Knowledge. If you've been given knowledge, don't just keep it to yourself, right? Speak up, teach your family, teach your loved ones, teach your coworkers. A lot of people shy away. Again, you know, we talked about that a little bit before, but shy away from speaking about their faith because they feel like, oh, I don't want to be looked down upon. But actually, a lot of people are open to learning, and you don't have to do it in the spirit of preaching to them or proselytizing, you know, where you're trying to convert people. Don't, I don't, you shouldn't do it that way, but you should teach them, you know, so that, for example, like a big common joke that I always hear is about, you know, being caught with your foot in the sink making will do, you know, and then people try to talk their way out of that. Why? Why talk your way out of that or not say anything? Why not say, oh, I'm performing ablution because as a Muslim, I have to pray five times a day. And there are certain parts of my body that we are, or our bodies that we're required to wash. And they are, like teach them. That will be so much better for that individual the next time they see someone with their foot in the sink or their wife or husband or daughter or child or whoever comes and says something to them, right, um, about it, they can then now educate. But if you're just like, uh-oh, you know, as if you did something wrong, and you don't want to teach them, or people who don't even talk to their coworkers about like Ramadan, why not? You know, be open about fasting instead of just hiding it and just, you know, you're, you go to the office party and everybody's offering you stuff. You're like, you know, it's okay, I have a stomach ache. Why? Like, but there are people who, who will do that. They'll go to lengths and lie instead of just being honest because they're too afraid of being outed as the Muslim. And, you know, the, I mean, that's a whole other topic, but I think the point is, is, Whatever blessings Allah Subhanahu has given you to uh, recognize it first and foremost from Him, but then to use it to inform, to educate, to help, to benefit other people. Inshallah. Yes. Mm
the purpose is the same for every single person. Every person, every jinn, every human being, we all have the same purpose, to know our Lord and to worship him as he deserves to be worshiped. That's why we're created. All of the other things that manifest in terms of our individual lives, right? Uh, if we wanna, you know, cultivate, like go down a certain field or path or whatever, that is just an addition, right? to our main purpose but the the main purpose is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you want to go into medicine or go into science or go become a teacher and you want to get married you want to have children you want to stay home you don't want to have, get married you don't want to have children whatever your personal choices are about the way you live your life are secondary right but your purpose the reason why you were brought to this planet and you know given life is the same as everybody else's which is to worship him and to uh, to to know him and to worship him. So yeah, we all have that same purpose, you know. And that's why it's our job as Muslims to speak up and teach people because there's a lot of people who don't know their purpose, who have been lied to, who've been you know falsely uh, you know led down a different way that tells them they you know have that it's all meaningless, right? This is what like nihilism is, right? This is what atheism leads to. There's no purpose. We're just here because we were fish and we evolved over time and now we're human beings. So they have a very, like, you know, like there's no purpose. So you're just going to die, you're going to die. Just do, And that's why they feel so justified in doing whatever they want to do. Because if there's no purpose, there's no consequences, right? If there's no God, there's no consequences to my actions, so I can do whatever I want to do. This is all shaitan, because that's what he wants people to do. He wants people to live without purpose. So when you actually share your faith with people um, and share that you do have a purpose and that it's it's so beautiful because it's you know um, it offers so much and, and meaning to your life, right? And you can share that with people they might have never heard that from anybody in their life. Imagine being raised in a family where there's never been faith. You know, and there, now we have generations of people who are, are like, yeah, agnostic, atheist. We never, we, they just celebrate, you know, Christmas or for fun, but they don't have a concept of faith, like that there's, you know, they don't have that. So maybe you'll be the first person to even introduce that idea to them and it'll plant a seed and inshallah, maybe Allah will guide them. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It starts with gaining knowledge, um, but also to know, like the Prophet said, for example, Balli anni walaw ayatan, okay, which is like teach even if it's just one ayah. So he's letting us know that we can all be teachers even with limited knowledge. Because shaitan might want to thwart you from benefiting people, just like what I said earlier about the Quran. You know, like, oh, I don't know Tajweed, I don't know Arabic, I shouldn't even read it out loud. Well, what happens to you? You don't have no relationship with the Book of Allah. Whereas if you say, you know, Allah knows my intention, and I'm trying to grow in my knowledge, and I'm trying to, you know, benefit other people, then I will teach what I know. And if I don't know, by the way, it's okay to say I don't know, but I will find out for you. Because sometimes that barrier is it prevents you from speaking up but if you were to just say you know what I'll do my best to answer and that's why qualifiers in the beginning of conversations are important like I'm not an expert I'll answer whatever questions you have but just know if I don't know anything I will check it and then come back you know and let you know uh, but I think you're right in the sense of this pressure that if I'm not an authority in Islam I should never speak up I, I think that is really a waswasa from shaitan because he doesn't want you to teach anything he'd rather you stay silent and just you know let people go in and out of your life without feeling the impact of your faith by telling you that than for you to teach them you know give them little you know bits here and there that at least give them something so i say teach what you know but always you know leave that door open that lets that person know if I don't have an answer to your question, I can certainly do, like ask people who do know, 
and come back and tell you. So it takes you, the pressure off of you, right? That you're not expected to know everything. But does that mean that your faith doesn't have the answers? No, right? Like the answers are there. I just might not know them, but at least I'll come back. And I mean, as someone who's been teaching and publicly speaking for a long time, that's happened to me several times, even now. Just recently, I was at a halqa, even in this class. You know, how many of you have asked me a question and I say, I don't know, but I'll ask. Because we can't expect to know every single thing that people ask of us. But the empowerment comes from knowing, inshallah, there are people who have knowledge and I can seek out the answers from them. Right? But thank you for that point, because it, it is a valid issue that I think a lot of people um, just need to be empowered with. Like, don't don't let, you know, um, and I think that's kind of also a sense of a false, you know, humility. Or not false humility, what's the blameworthy modesty, right? We talked about blameworthy modesty because it prevents you from doing good. So get over that shyness of like, oh, I'm going to look like I don't know and say, it's okay if I don't know. There's ulama, like Imam Malik was known to be, he very commonly say, I don't know. It was one of his, you know, so it's okay. It's actually a measure of your intelligence to recognize what you know and what you don't know. Right? Did you have a question? Is there anything else? Oh, okay. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> of course, it's aligning yourself with the prophetic model, right? Because Yes, <laughs> and of course. No, ibadah is ritual actions, but it's also becoming more as close to his example as possible because he was the perfect worshiper. He was the perfect abd, right? He was thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every minute and every moment, and he had his, that presence, and he, he was the walking Qur'an. So it's like, you know, just to follow his footsteps will give you that, uh, inshallah, actualization, yeah. So we'll stop for the hut, inshallah, and then we'll resume. All right, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So we, our, our last disease of the heart was derision. And then, alhamdulillah, you know, the book has several different sections that are very um, helpful, uh, just as, you know, to kind of summarize a lot of the points that were made. Um, so I wanted to go to comprehensive treatment for the heart. And this is on page 130. So let's read those verses together. A comprehensive treatment plan for the heart's diseases is to deny the self of its desires, enjoin hunger, keep worship vigilance in the night, be silent, and meditate in private. Also keep company with good people who possess sincerity, those who are emulated in their states and statements, and finally take refuge in the one unto whom all affairs return. That is the most beneficial treatment for all of the previous diseases. This must be to the point in which you are like a man drowning or someone lost in a barren desert and, need, and see no source of succor except from the guardian, possessor of the greatest power. He is the one who responds to the call of the distressed. So Imam Maulud's approach in offering the cures for these diseases is like the story of the Gordian knot of the kingdom of Phrygia whose uh, king offered his dominion to whoever was, an, uh, was able to unravel the knot. Many tried and failed. When Alexander the Great was shown the knot, he pulled out his sword and cut through it. Diseases of the heart are like the Gordian knot, and the best way to treat them is to cut through them. Imam Maulud completes his discussion on the various diseases and turns his attention to a comprehensive treatment plan for the heart, which focuses on curbing the soul from its own excessive desires. So he goes into different, um, you know, advices on how to do this. The first advice he gives, he says, what? To accomplish this, he states that one must engage in hunger. 
And then there's several different paragraphs that talk about how hunger is uh, rooted or is oftentimes tied to, um, you know, developing so many of these diseases of the heart. If you can't show self-restraint uh, or if you're a glutton and you indulge your, your you know, your base desires, your carnal desires all the time, which often have to do with your appetites, right, then it leads to these diseases of the heart. So um, getting being in the practice of depriving oneself through fasting and then just through general, you know, restraint will actually help curb a lot of temptations and a lot of other things that lead to developing the diseases of the heart. So there's many different chapters that talk about um, that. For example, on page 132, spiritual masters traditionally have focused on hunger. The goal is not to create a nation of anorexics, but to cut the knot that binds self-discipline. We do things often out of blind conditioning. When it comes to food, many have been drilled into believing that three meals are not only normal, but necessary for proper nutritional fulfillment. However, this is not true. The caloric intake of an average American far exceeds what is needed for physiological well-being. As a result, America is now recognized as the most obese nation on earth, according to the National Institutes of Health. Um, and then skipping the next chapter, going to the following one. People nowadays consume much more food than ever before. Sorry, paragraph. Did I say chapter again? I'm constantly confusing the word paragraph and chapter. People nowadays consume much more food than ever before, and this is especially the case with meat. In the past, meat was eaten infrequently, even by the affluent, who had it once or twice a week. The poor ate meat once or twice a year, mainly around the time of Eid. Furthermore, snacking has become so common now that many do not go for more than a few hours without consuming something. Convenience stores and vending machines are found everywhere. This abundance was unheard of not long ago. All of this has virtually turned people into grazing animals, which is an anathema to spiritual wellness. In their study of eating habits, sociologists have found that the average American has 20 food contacts a day. In most traditional cultures, meals were set for specific times, and eating between meals was not accept uh, acceptable. So then, you know, goes on to talk further about that. And if you um, go down to page 133, the second to last paragraph, he says, people who have a problem with excessive eating should start at least by lessening the portion of what they normally eat, which is the beginning of discipline. It is also advised to eat with other people, for eating with guests would make a person more conscious of being a glutton. Also, the more people who sit around a table, the greater the blessings, the barakah. Finally, one should decrease the number of meals in a day. It is not surprising that Imam Mawlud mentions hunger first among the comprehensive treatments for the heart. Eating is one of the most abused behaviors. We are conditioned to think that hunger is sated only when we feel full. One typical meal served in an average American restaurant can feed a family in West Africa. So really strong points there about how to fix our relationship with food. Because again, if we can show restraint, we find that there's a correlation, right? The, the more we're able to have mastery over our nafs and not indulge our every whim, desire, craving, the more we can discipline our soul to prevent from these diseases of the heart's rooting, taking root, right? So the next um, advice he offers is the night vigil. Okay, that's right at that very last sentence on page 133. If one wishes to enliven the heart, then one should give it time with its Lord in the stillness of the dark, even if it is only two rakah. Imam Malik says to never leave the night prayer vigil even for a little time. Being consistent with the night prayer and all the other meritorious and all other meritorious things is important. It is better to rise at night for just 10 minutes on a regular basis than to stay up for hours one night and then sleep the next night. The performance of this prayer on a patchwork basis results in little benefit. Sidi Ahmed Zarouk said, it is like drilling here and there, never finding water anywhere. So 
Um, you know, waking up in the middle of the night is a very important practice. Depending on your work schedule, be wise about it. Like if you have to get up early anyway for Fajr and then from that point forward your day starts, then it's wiser to schedule your awakening closer to that time. So maybe 30 minutes before Fajr, okay? It's still considered part of the Hajjid because Fajr hasn't entered. It's still part of that night. Some people, you know, think that this is like, you know, maybe a few hours after they fall asleep, but that can be very disruptive to your sleep schedule. And it's hard to maintain if you do that regularly. I mean, you can always train yourself. There are people who've done that to not be so dependent on sleep. But if you want to make this a regular practice, I say start always by waking up a little bit before Fajr and pray, you know, start, you know, with whatever you feel you can do. If you're the type that as soon as you wake up, you're alert and you're ready to take on the day, then, you know, the habit or the, the Prophet ﷺ Sunnah was to do 10 rakah, okay? He would usually do 10. Um, and then witr, he would add witr as well. You could do witr, um, you know, before and just do the 10, however, but trying to work your way up to that is good. You know, you could start with two rakah first, and then if you feel like this isn't hard for me, I can keep doing more, get to that point where inshallah it becomes easy and you'll see it becoming facilitated. And then, inshallah, you know, soon after Fajr is in, you pray your Fajr and then you start the day and you'll see the, the benefit of that barakah throughout your entire day, you know it'll really, you'll start to notice just the way that you feel. You'll feel the sense of serenity, the sense of, you know, just safety, the security that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in your heart. And inshallah, you know, those du'as that you make in those hours, those intimate hours between, you know, you and your Lord, when the whole world is asleep, your family's asleep, you know, are um, very powerful and they're mustajab. So it's like whatever need you have in this life, that's where you take it. You take it to, the, you know, the prayer rug um, in that hour, and you'll see, inshallah, Allah will either fulfill your need or replace it with something better, inshallah, in this life or the next life. But you'll you'll feel the benefit of that. So, you know, be uh, make the intention always. Every night before you sleep, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to wake you up and set your alarm. You know, be proactive. Don't just expect it to happen, you know, without some effort, set your alarm for a little bit, but ask Allah to give you the strength. Cause sometimes you might want to, but in that moment you get so tired and it's like, oh, it's okay tomorrow, you know, but if you keep persisting and don't like give up and feel like, okay, I've done it a week now and I'm a loser. I haven't even woken up yet. I shouldn't bother. Don't do that. That's waswasa. Keep every single morning yourself accountable and have the same knee. Ya Allah, please wake me up for tahajjud. And if it takes you two weeks, three weeks, a month, keep doing it. Because at some point, you yourself are going to hate <laughs> the, the, the fact that you keep not doing it and you will finally get up. And that will be the beginning, right? So push yourself to it, inshallah. And then to make it, you know, really intimate, obviously, you know, keep it private. Um, it's between you and yourself. Don't try to be subtle in the sounds that you make. You know, don't go and turn on the water and like start blowing your nose at like the loudest, you know, sound possible. Just, you know, because it's you, for you and Allah, you know, you don't want to wake up the whole household or the neighborhood, you know. <laughs> um, and then obviously don't share it with people. This is a very private thing between you and Allah. So if you're someone who does it, you don't share it. You don't need to tell people, oh, yeah, I'm so tired. I've been up since 3 in the morning, you know, <laughs> doing what? Oh, you know, <laughs> the hajjid, you know, and I was communing with my Lord as I always do. You know, you don't need to brag about that. It's going to take away from all of your, you know, barakah. So keep, it's a totally private thing between you and Allah. And just keep it, honestly, if you get to that place where you do it more and more, may Allah give us strength for all of us to do it regularly, you will find that it becomes uh, part of your worship that is the, the sweetest part of your worship. Because everything else is like, you know, you're just doing it, you, you got to move, and there's so many distractions. You know, in the daytime, it's like from prayer to prayer, you're, even if you're doing dhikr, you're always thinking about what's next. But the stillness of the night, right, is what is sweet about that time, is that there's really no rush. You're not rushed. You're not distracted. You're not 
you know, waiting for some phone call or meeting that's going to happen in a few minutes at work or your child's going to come home from school. You know, all those things, uh, even if we don't mean to, they can distract us from being present. But when you have no distractions in that moment, then you can actually be present, right? And that's where there's so much power in that. So, alhamdulillah, uh, we should all, inshallah, strive for that on a regular basis. And then... <clears throat> The next paragraph, the Prophet said, spread peace, feed needy people, and pray at night when others are asleep, and you will enter paradise with ease. SubhanAllah. In the Quran, the Prophet's night prayer is associated with the elevated rank he shall be granted by God. And in a portion of the night, rise therein for night prayer, an extra act of devotion for you. It may be that your Lord shall raise you to a praiseworthy station. God the Exalted commends those who deprive their sides from their beds, resist sleep, which the body loves, and rise for prayer. And that's Quran chapter 32, verse 16. It is not our tradition for one to be excessive in spiritual practices such that one is deprived of sleep to the point of becoming psychotic or deprived of food to the point that one's health is damaged. On the contrary, one should learn to control the soul's desires and not be controlled by them. The Prophet said that our bodies have rights over us. They are food, drink, and companionship. So, you know, kind of just finding the balance. This isn't about total deprivation and harm. It's about the opposite. It's about wanting to gain, gain mastery over the soul so that you actually have a stronger connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it, you're, you, you actually become stronger to resist the temptations of the dunya because they're everywhere. So the purpose of it is to become strong, not to become weak, right? And so then there's many different chapters that talk further about the virtues of standing for the night prayer, many hadith and different stories. Um, if we go on to page 136, um, the very ne the next advice he gives is that last paragraph. Imam Mawlud mentions next the importance of silence. The Prophet ﷺ said, if a person is given silence, he is given wisdom. The tongue is a great temptation. It is easy to say something that brings ruin upon its speaker. Learning how to control the tongue is an enormous discipline. Imam al-Shafi said that whenever he was in a gathering and wanted to say something, he would check his soul and be sure that his intentions were pure and were not to prove himself or flaunt his knowledge. Imam al-Shafi was a man of great intelligence and encyclopedic knowledge, yet he often enjoyed silence upon himself. He once said, I never had a debate with anyone except that I prayed to God that he make the truth appear on the tongue of my opponent so I could submit to it. I mean, subhanAllah, these are the people of Allah, right? That kind of humility, that type of awareness. So just really being in the practice of not speaking too much unless you have, again, something of virtue to say, but you've already gone through that process of checking your intentions, making sure that you're not doing it for the wrong reasons, right? All the diseases that we talked about before, right? Riyadh, wanting to be known, all of those things are very dangerous to the soul. So, um, and you can sometimes, you know, be tricked into thinking you're doing a good thing because, oh, I'm teaching, I'm, you know, but if your intention is off, it's actually bringing you harm. So that's why it's so important to check the intention. And if it's, you know, there's sometimes, for example, um, you might be in a gathering where there's other learned people there, you know, and I'm sure we've all done this, we've all witnessed it, but if there's a discussion happening and someone has covered a lot of the points that you would have made had you spoken first, is it necessary for you to speak, right? Is it necessary for you to just say, oh yeah, I agree, and da 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 and then you reiterate every single thing they just said. So we have to check ourselves, why did I need to do that? If it was already said, right, in the gathering by someone else, is it, um, then, is it because I wanted to also say that I know that too, or that I was going to say it before you, but you beat me to it. You know, these are the little tricks and subtle, you know, things that the nafs does that if we become aware of ourselves, we'll realize like, that's just a game. I don't want to fall into that. It was already said, and it doesn't matter who said it. But if it matters to me that I am associated as being the one who said it, uh-oh, right? I have to 
check myself, check my intention. So these are the types of thoughts we have to have before we speak and to really try to just practice, you know. And I see, subhanAllah, when you spend time with people who are very um, much, you know, more experienced, they have more years and more knowledge, you find this is a common quality. They tend not to talk very much. Even their answers are short, you know. When they give you an answer, sometimes you want more, but it's they're giving you the minimum for a reason because they're, they've learned this, that it's just better not to keep rambling. Some of us have still a problem with this because we're always looking to make sure things are clear, but you know, it's a, it's a skill set that will come over time that you just start speaking very few words. Here, Imam Maddox said about one of his students, he is a good man except he speaks a month's worth of words in a day. So just to know, like, it's not a good quality to be too verbose and, you know, gregarious. In some cultures, it's celebrated. And I think in our, in this society, the more, yeah, you know, socially, like, you can, you know what I mean, maneuver from one conversation to another. It's lauded as being really a good quality. But if you're over speaking and you're talking too much, you're talking over people, then you have to look at it's actually not a good quality just because you're you know articulate and you might even have something intelligent to say if you're doing it to that point where that's you know what people know of you and you dominate every conversation and you don't let other people really speak then it's not a good quality right you're it's your center stage always so step back practice more restraint and listen learn to listen and you might find you know more benefit in that <clears throat> And he talks about spiritual isolation for the purpose of reflection. So this is also part of, you know, trying to maintain more silence is that you remove yourself from opportunities where you're talking a lot or socializing a lot. Because idle talk is, you know, unfortunately very common now. So sometimes we might, you know, visit friends and family or in gatherings. And we're there because we feel obligated to be there. But if the conversations are just you know, idle and they're not really on anything important and of value, then it can harm us. So it's better sometimes to retreat and not always be at every single gathering or social event and to say, you know, I'm going to, I'd rather just stay home. And you'll see that, you know, some company, yeah, they, they end up, you end up walking away feeling worse, right? When you keep some people's company, because even if you didn't intend to, maybe they told you, some riba or something that uh, that happened to them, or they're just venting and complaining about their lives, and so now you're you feel heavy, and it's like, man, what a waste of my time! I shouldn't have even gone, you know. So you have to, as you get older, be very select in who you spend time with, and if there's people in your life that drag you down, they don't remind you of Allah, they don't pick you up, they don't lift you up, they don't uh, encourage you, they don't correct you in the right way, you know. But they kind of just you know, are there to, again, you know, talk about whatever and, and lead you into these things, then you have to, it's better to not socialize. It's better to stay away. And not in a rude way. You don't have to, you know, turn them away. It's just a matter of being more selective. So opting out of attending certain things or that's okay next time. Gracefully, you know, doing it gracefully. And then he says, the next uh, <coughs> advice <coughs> for the overall treatment is in, is in that third paragraph. He says, next in the overall treatment of the heart, Imam Maulud speaks of the importance of keeping the company of good people, which is, which is God's command. Oh, you who believe fear God and be among the truthful ones. It is astonishing how people can influence others simply by being in each other's company. Imam al-Haddad said, the company one keeps has major effects. It may lead to either benefit and improvement or harm and corruption, depending on whether the company is that of pure and eminent people or those who are immoral and evil. This effect does not appear suddenly, but is a gradual process that unfolds with time. So, you know, we, we talked a lot about what constitutes good company, but people who truly fear Allah who um, in their actions and their comportment and their character, you know, are following the prophetic example, 
these are people you want to keep the company of, people who remind you of Allah, people who don't talk about other people, who mind their own business. Very important, you know, if, if people are doing that stuff, even if they're outwardly again practicing, it's not good for you to be in that company very often, right? Or divulging their private affairs to you. A lot of times, especially I think with female friendships, there is this um, really wrong notion that I'm only close to you if you tell me really private business. You know, then I, that's that's a measure of our closeness and our friendship. That is not, that is wrong. If someone is expecting you to share your relationship, you know, with them, for example, I mean, your marital relationship with them or just business that's private um, as a measure of how close they are to you, like your secrets, what you've done in the past, mistakes you've made, those are nobody's business. And so that's a big red flag to not, you know, in terms of friendships, like stay away from people who always want to know your business. Okay. Because people of adab don't ask you private questions about your life. They don't. It's none of their business, and they, they know that. Um, and then at the top of page 138, companionship yields two kinds of impact. One that drags a person down to the compost of the world, and the other that points towards God, the exalted, and an existence that lasts forever. A companion who tries to sell the ephemeral stuff of this life and makes it the substance of conversation and pursuit is dragging the soul earthward. It is better beyond compare to seek out the company of those who help one achieve contentment with God. When one is content, little will suffice, but without contentment, nothing suffices. So just, you know, final point about choosing your friends wisely. Um, and then number five, Imam Maulud says that seeking refuge with God is the most efficacious treatment for all diseases of the heart. Sidi Ibn Ashir says the only real cure for all these diseases is to go to God with complete, unconditional imploring. What is meant here is urgently seeking refuge in God's protection and guidance to seek this as if one were holding on to a thread over a canyon. It is begging which before God is honorable. Most converts to Islam have said that before they became Muslims, they reached a point in their lives in which they petitioned with all their heart and emotion that God guide them. In the haze of confusion and spiritual morass, they literally begged for it. Just show me what to do. Afterwards, it became easy and the path very clear. This is what Imam Maulud is suggesting. There is nothing nonchalant in this act. So once you, you know, recognize, and we've gone over now 25, right, different diseases. Once you're being honest with yourself and you recognize what diseases you have and, you know, how severe they are, the severity of each one, this is it. You know, you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you ask him for the strength. Like, I don't want to be diseased, you know, please help me, please remove these things from my heart, show me the way, give me the right friends and companions, uh, you know, help me and really petition sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do that for you. And then follow the other advices, start taking those steps because everything, um, you know, it's all advice from people who've lived these things. You know, this, is, this isn't just, you know, they know what they're talking about. So when they tell us to, you know, practice, you know, uh, restraint and, you know, have more control over our nafs, don't eat as much, don't be a glutton, don't indulge your nafs all the time. They know what they're talking about. When they tell us to wake up for night prayer, when they tell us to keep good company, you know, when they tell us to do, uh, you know, increase salawat and the Prophet says him to do, they get all the advices that we've heard throughout. It's all because there's proven, you know, this is, there's, it's, it's effective. It's proven to be effective to do all those things that people come out better, polished, you know, uh, versions of themselves because they're actually taking the steps to becoming a, a better person. Um, but again, this imploring to God with that sense of desperation and real true yearning and sincerity is very important. Um, mashallah, there's a lot of great content in the next section as well, beneficial actions for purifying the heart. A lot of it is, you know, summarizing what we've already kind of talked about. So I wanted to actually move forward to the next one because 
this one is really key. Um, the root of all diseases of the heart. That's on page 146. Because again, we're still, you know, talking about um, how these things manifest and take hold of us. So it's important to see what different scholars um, have attributed as the root okay, of all diseases. So the comprehensive root of the heart's diseases, according to Imam Maulud, is love of the temporal world. So the author of this poem, he believes that the root disease is hubad dunya. That because you, we love the dunya so much, that that disease is where all these other diseases stem from. Okay, it actually comes from that. Um, and then he also says that this is the opinion of Imam al-Hilali and Imam ibn Ashir. Ibn Abbas said that it was covetousness, tama. Okay, um, and that's you know just wanting. You, the, you're unable to control this desire. You want everything for yourself, right? To covet. Um, there are differences of opinion regarding the mother cause of diseases of the heart. But their differences are shades of understanding rather than alternate paradigms. When Imam Ibn Hashr says that it is the love of power and authority, it comes down to love of the world. What is power and authority other than branches of the world? Imam Ibn Al-Ta'ila, who is often quoted in, the, in this book and mentioned by name in this passage of Imam Mawlud's poem, was a master of the science of the heart. His book of aphorisms is one of the most highly regarded masterpieces in Islamic spiritual tradition. His 35th aphorism in that collection reads, so this is from um, Imam Ibn Al-Ta'ila. He says, the source of every disobedience, indifference, and passion is self-satisfaction. The source of every obedience, vigilance, and virtue is dissatisfaction with oneself. It is better for you to keep company with an ignorant man dissatisfied with himself than to keep company with a learned man satisfied with himself. For what knowledge is there in a self-satisfied scholar? And what ignorance is there in an unlearned man dissatisfied with himself? Nowadays, there is an urgency to root out the feeling of shame. There are self-help books to show how to excise this out of the soul. However, dissatisfaction with oneself is the very thing that causes people to reflect and reevaluate, which is requisite for spiritual success. Shame and dissatisfaction can be moral lifesavers. Shame is different from self-esteem, low self-esteem, in which one feels contempt for himself. And so then we're going to read, inshallah, we'll continue. But just a point about that, you know, th it's very powerful if you think about it, because as, you know, he said here, if one is satisfied with oneself, right, it doesn't really make you think you need to improve on anything, does it? If you're like, while well, I'm wearing my hijab, I'm praying, I'm doing the best I can do, I'm working, I'm a good mother, I'm a good daughter, I'm a good wife. You're just, you know, patting yourself on the back <laughs> for every single thing that you become, what, complacent, like I'm, I'm good enough where I am. That doesn't motivate you to want to be better, does it, in anything. You could have the same attitude in work or in any relationship you have. So the opposite is true that when you're not feeling satisfied with yourself and you're it's not good enough right and you think oh, i know i can do better then you actually start to wanting to be better and wanting to do better so the you know that that's why his opinion that this is the root of all diseases is is so powerful because it does start with the self right as long as uh, i'm thinking that everything's fine and i'll be fine then i don't have no incentive or motivation to be better. But if I don't, if I'm not happy with myself, I know I can do better. I'm aware of my faults and flaws and I want to get rid of them because it makes me uncomfortable. Then that, those are the motivating thoughts that are going to make you do the work. Right? So then Sidi Ahmed Zarouq said that there are three signs of being overly content with the soul. First is being sensitive to one's own rights and indifferent to the rights of others. Okay. In Islam, one's responsibilities preponderate over one's rights. 
Okay, so that itself, look at how, like, um, you know, our world is now. Everybody's worried about themselves, right? It's the opposite. It's not worrying about, you know, other people. It's worrying about them, you know, yourself. And so it, it, this is the first sign. If, if, if you're doing this where you're just consumed by, you know, advancing your own agenda, pushing your what's going to benefit you and you're not really looking at the benefit to other people, then you clearly have this problem, right? You're just you're satisfied with yourself, and you're you're too content with your own soul. So, <clears throat> the second sign is ignoring one's own faults, as if one has none, while being preoccupied with the faults of others. So again, you know, if you're quick to point out other people's mistakes, other people's faults, but then you have a problem when someone points out yours, and you, know, you can't take criticism well. You, you know, it offends you easily, um, but you have no problem constantly complaining about what everybody else is doing wrong. This is another sign. Okay. And the third sign is giving oneself too much leniency. So, again, if you're making exceptions to rules always for yourself, right, this is another problem where it's like, oh, it's okay. This time I'll just skip this or I'll do it this, you know, this way this time. And you're, um, you kind of, you know, like I said, change the rules for yourself and you're very lenient on yourself, but again, critical of other people. This would be the third sign. So, and then he goes on to say, Sidi Ahmed Zarukh then said that there are three signs that someone is not content with themselves. So if you're content with yourself, that's what you do. Your rights matter. Other people's don't, right? You are quick to, um, uh, ignore your own faults, but you can point out everybody else's faults, and you're very lenient with yourself, but maybe rigid with other people, okay? But if you're not satisfied with yourself, there's also three different qualities. First is when a person checks himself, is self-accusing and wary of his intentions. So this is a good sign. If you're walking away from a situation and you're not sure about your own intentions and you're, you know, kind of doing that whole internal thought process of like, oh, why, why did I do what I, that? Or did I, you know, was my intention pure? That self-check is a good sign that you're not content with yourself because just second guessing yourself is a sign that you have the humility to know that you can make mistakes and you may have just made mistakes, right? But if you don't even think on that level and it doesn't occur to you to ever do that type of, hmm, why did you say that? What did you do that for? You know, that kind of internal dialogue. That means you're, you don't think, you know, you don't think you make mistakes to even do that, you see? So it's a good habit to have to always question yourself. Um, uh, and he says, Yusuf alayhi salam, who was known for his exceptional purity, said, I do not declare myself innocent. But the soul often commands evil, except upon whom my Lord has mercy. One should ask oneself, am I doing this for show or for the sake of God? So that's usually, that's the line of, you know, questioning that we should have after everything we do, especially in a public setting. What was my intention? Was it so that people could recognize me doing that, so that I would have praise, you know, that I would be seen, or was it truly because I just wanted to do it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for him to be pleased with me, okay? Second is being careful of the blemishes of the soul. The Prophet said, supplicated, oh God, do not leave me to the soul even for a blink of an eye. So always being worried, okay, about what you could potentially fall into and not thinking that you're above anything. That type of reality and humility is very important because if you ever think that you're too good or that you would never do something because you were raised better or differently or, you know, people get in a little ahead of themselves um, and then they judge other people, right? Because that statement only comes after judging someone else for doing that thing, right? Oh my God, how could they? I would never do that. Well, you made a very bold statement and you're basically saying that you're better and, you know, and if you do that and you're very judgmental, then there is, you know, another hadith that says, before you die, you will be likely afflicted with the very same thing that you were judging someone of. So you have to be very careful from doing that. But always kind of thinking that 
you are susceptible to pretty much any disease and any sin, right? I mean, if in my in the way for me when I think about it, and I think you know, Subhanallah, people who were with the Prophet and the companions, some of them fell into major sins. They fell into major sins. They were still considered companions, you know, but they faltered. And if here he is performing miracles, clear, you know, people are witness to all of you know, to who he is, but they're still able to fall because their souls are weak, then who are we to think that we couldn't fall, you know, into certain things? It's really just, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance and his protection over us that protects us from our own selves. So again, we give the credit back to where it's due, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's guiding us and protecting us. And ya Allah, please don't like, you know, remove that from me. Always keep me guided because in the absence of your guidance, I can fall. I likely will fall. But being very aware of that. The third is forcing the self to do difficult things such as, as we talked about, eating less, spending money in charity, right? Waking up for the night prayers. All of those things that we talked about that requires disciplining the soul is a sign of a person who is not content with themselves because they realize that in order to become better i have to force i have to work against my nafs my nafs is can always want you know me to indulge it and to not do the difficult things but i have to actually fight that impulse and uh and so these are the three signs okay um And just a you know disclaimer here, being vigilant about one's own faults does not amount to self-loathing or depletion of confidence. In fact, confidence gives one the courage to find fault in oneself. A poet once said, I never saw a fault from among, among the faults of humanity like the sloth of people capable of human perfection. I mean, that's beautiful, right? Because it's, I mean, it's a warning, but it's also beautiful in that it's saying that, you know, there's... Um, we can, we're capable of actually becoming the best versions of ourselves. We have that, especially if we put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and learn to prioritize. But it's usually our own sloth that prevents us from doing that. So it's, you know, it puts it back on, on the individual that you're capable of it. You know, Allah will make it easy for you. You just have to fight against your own self and want it and do the actions necessary, but inshallah, you're capable of really being, you know, the best version of yourself. Um, and then, alhamdulillah. Yeah, so there's a lot more, again, amazing content here. Um, talks a lot about the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the importance of dhikr on page 150 importance of the kid, the remembrance of God. There's many different chapters there. Um, this is a beautiful story by Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal uh, on page 151 at the top. It is said that Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal had 99 dreams about God the Exalted. In one of them, he asked the Almighty about all the things that draw a worshiper near to him. Which of them was the greatest? He was told it was the recitation of Qur'an. With or without comprehension, he asked, and the reply was, with or without comprehension. Not understanding the language of the Qur'an should not bar one from receiving the blessings in this exalted practice. The authority of this position is not borrowed from the dream of a great man, but it is corroborated by proofs offered by many scholars throughout the ages. The only time when the Qur'an is not the preferred dhikr is when other obligations are immediately pressing. So the greatest of all dhikr is, is the recitation um, of the Qur'an, and it's recommended at the top, it says there, to read from the Qur'an itself, as opposed to just reciting from memory, because it involves the eyes, the hands, and the ears. So um, just knowing, you know, this is the greatest form of dhikr. Also, um, on the next page, he talks about other forms of dhikr, which is to, you know, make uh, istighfar, and he goes on to the virtues of saying is increased istighfar, uh, on saying salawat on the Prophet ﷺ. So the rest of the this section just expands on on how, the different forms of dhikr and how all of those um, help one to again 
align oneself and one's heart with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to protect from these diseases of the heart. So there's a lot of, mashallah, great content. Again, I'm sure um, if you haven't already, you you can read this in the remaining weeks and get to especially the section on page 174, which I'll leave for you guys to read, but it's on Ramadan and purification. That's a really great section because in preparing for Ramadan, um, you know, he talks about, I'll just read this first section. He says, the month of Ramadan is a special time for purifying oneself, the greatest opportunity to implement the discussions and cures with regards to the heart. In fact, this is the purpose, blessing, and secret of the month. So everything in this book that we've been talking about, be in the practice of it, start, you know, doing the things, but read that section because it's kind of like a fast track, you know, the month of Ramadan, there's so much barakah and blessings in it, but to work on really rooting out these diseases during that month and, and taking on those practices that we talked about. First of all, the hunger part is taken care of, right? You're abstaining from food and drink. So that's one, but increased night prayers, all those things that will help to rid our, us, inshallah, of these diseases, they're facilitated in the month of Ramadan. So we can work towards those things now, but especially in that month, we should be um, working hard. And so read that section. But alhamdulillah, we were able to finish. <laughs> I wanted to thank all of you for coming. Um, alhamdulillah. And this has you know, been a wonderful seven weeks in the company of um, all of you. I'm very honored to have uh, conducted this class and finished it, alhamdulillah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance and for tawfiq in implementing everything that we learned together and to increase us and in our, bless our homes, uh, protect our children, our families, inshallah, uh, and to always keep us uh, close to him and close to his beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I ask that you please make dua for um, our beloved uh, teacher, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, who took the effort to translate this beautiful poem for us, the English speaking, uh, you know, um, my, um, group or uh, people who could benefit from this, alhamdulillah. Otherwise, you know, many texts, there's so many texts that are in Arabic that we don't have access to, but alhamdulillah for our scholars, all of them who take the time to um, provide, you know, to, to work on, on making this accessible for us. So let's keep them in our du'as, that this is a sadaqah jariya for him, inshallah, and his family, uh, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases him and protects him and all of his teachers going all the way back uh, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, may Allah increase our love for him and may we align ourselves with his uh, character, inshallah, in every which way. I mean, another uh, book that I wanted to recommend, actually, because when I read it recently, I was just so, um, I had read it a while ago, but I read it again. And in the context of this science, it's beautiful. Uh, it's the introduction to the prayer of the oppressed. And actually, um, if you go onto the Zaytuna College website, the Renovatio, which is their, the journal that they produce, um, they actually took the excerpt that I was going to recommend for you, and um, it's posted on the Renovatio's current newest edition that just came out this past week. Uh, it's incredible, the introduction of this. It really is, and it, to it just pairs so perfectly with this book. I wished we had time. It's a bit lengthy, otherwise I would have read it, but I think it'll be better that if you read it on your own. So you can, if you don't have the book, you can access it. Um, the introduction from the Zaytuno website or, or also the Sandala web website. They also have the entire introduction posted. But you'll see when you read it how it perfectly pairs with everything that we've talked about during the course of these seven weeks. And this text is just a really great compliment, especially in our world today with everything that's happening politically, socially, all of the changes that our world has gone through. The context of it, I think, is really relevant. So I highly encourage everybody to read it, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Of course, the prayer of the oppressed. And this is uh, also translation and introduction. It's another text that he did the same. He translated, and, and it's from uh, Imam Muhammad bin Nasir al-Dari. Um, so it's a wonderful book to get if you don't have it. I highly recommend it. But especially if you can for just kind of, you know, again, bring all of the points that we've been talking about over the past few weeks together. I felt like this introduction 
paired really well with everything that we, we discussed here. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. And again, uh, we'll end in dua, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shahadu wa la ilaha ila anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wal asr inna linsana la fi khusr illa ladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima al-kathira. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan.